Hey, what's up, my friends? It is another Wednesday night, and I'm so excited for this show. We got a crew of legends on deck. We are going to be talking about something pretty weird and very neato. But first of all, I got to give thanks to Volo, my buddy Oliver, for crafting that brand new intro music for the show. It feels good to actually own the music, <laughs> like to have it made custom by somebody who's into the vibe of what we do for here on Vibrant. So, you know, if you like that, you should go follow Volo on Spotify or buy some of his music on Bandcamp. He's great. As Dylan said, the music is definitely suited for the infinite spiral upwards on the path to wisdom. So tonight we're going to be talking about the Sola Bushka Tarot, which is one of the most odd decks you could probably ever come across. It definitely shares very little in common other than the uh, numerical structure with the tarots that you will see in the modern age. We're going to explore that. This was Mario's idea. I brought our most learned Italian here to help us decode the, the thing. We got Dylan Sicoccio on deck, fresh off the heels of a great Crow 777 episode. Go check him out over there. That dropped today. We got Gabriel, the slickest of dissident. And uh, so, we, yeah, gentlemen, how are you guys doing? I'm doing amazing. Uh, it was, it's snowing like crazy here. Biggest snow of the year. So I went four-wheeling today with my family. And uh, or four wheel driving, I should say. And uh, yeah, it had the great, uh, the response was really good for Crow. And uh, I'm excited for the Sola Busca or Busha or the private search. And it's uh, very reminiscent of the Kabbalistic paths of wisdom being private ones. So I'm excited. I've never, I've never heard of this deck. So all of this is going to be new for me. Yeah, we'll be all kind of shooting from the hip here. I think Mario's got some ideas coming in and Gabriel's never out of ideas. <laughs> uh, so Mario, and how, how appropriate doing, though, how appropriate uh, it's made in Venice or it's Venetian and who are the Phoenicians and uh, Mario's name is literally Maur Yo or the great God. And his last name, if you drop the aspirate in the R, you have Aza, the goat. In Aramaic, is Mario the goat greatest of all time? I think he <laughs> could be. Super Mario. We shall see. <laughs> also, Super the Mario. fourth card, the uh, the alternate for the emperor is Mario. Mario. That's right. Yep, exactly. That's one of the Mario cards. I want to yep. Yeah. So uh, I'm stoked to talk, man. Uh, this deck is really, really mysterious, and there's just so many secrets encoded within it that I think have yet to really be revealed. So that is like the most exciting thing to me is that anybody can pick up this deck, and if you start studying, you can come across secrets that have not been talked about basically ever. So to me, that is just one of the uh, greatest things about this deck is that, um, you know, it's just this well of information that has yet to be tapped. So this is going to be a good time for sure. It absolutely is. Now, while I have a captive audience, I'm going to do a little shameless plug here. I launched a new merch store. So there's some things up there. I've been working on it over the last couple of days. Still time to maybe order something for the holidays, you know, Christmas present to yourself. But uh, we've got this fun uh, uh, yoga mat that was inspired by my conversation with George Wiseman, the Aqua Cure yoga mat. Whoa. Looking pretty cool, right? Spiffy. <laughs> Your stuff looks awesome, man. <laughs> and uh, Dylan, you'll like this one. I call this shirt the Everything is Buddha shirt. <laughs> it's sure to be helpful when you want to start conversations about how every savior deity is actually Buddha. You got the front, <laughs> you got the back here. Yeah. Nice. So cool. I have a ton of art from over the years that has been needing, you know, a place on some merchandise and I just been making it to make it, but there's some fun stuff. Like I'm going to add more as I go, but you got a 500 piece jigsaw puzzle. That's pretty cool. You made all this art. Oh yeah. Yeah. I have a ton more too. I do like just hardcore marker doodles like this. Takes, that is takes so a while. cool. Yeah. Thanks guys. And I'll show you a couple more. I like how this shirt turned out. Pretty intense. Awesome. <laughs> there might be a market for this in Mexico. Wow. I'm sure. <laughs> Imagine if like everybody in Mexico just blew this up because it was so like it reminds me of a lot of that art. 
Yeah. So there'll be, there'll be more coming. Keep your eye on it. It's I'll link it in the chat, but it's interversemerch.com. And, you know, thank, I thank whoever it is out there that's going to be the first to purchase something. <laughs> and you can use the code interverse for the next month to get 15% off your order in just in time for the holidays. Solid. Nice. Yeah. Dude. Way thank cool. You. And yeah, those are sweatpants, PK. There are sweatpants on there. Maybe I should show those two real quick. There, I think I might redo these, but if you like it how it is, uh, I might change the way the art is centered. Kind of hard to get artwork onto pants. <laughs> But yeah, but still pretty. That's still good. Like, looks a lot better than all their merch. Yeah, I, I I do my best. So thanks everybody in advance. Like I said, and right. So let's get into the solar bushka because we have a lot to talk about. Uh, first, what Dylan mentioned about this coming from a Venetian family is very interesting. I think just the fact that the artwork was commissioned at all. Like, uh, I'll pull up some images here. You know, this is not a small task in terms of when this came out. Do you guys know what, what year it's said to have originated from? 1490, 1491-ish. Yeah, so a long ass time ago. <laughs> and it's not easy to do. Like, this was masterpiece art. So I have some slides of the, the Tromps. And even though they don't exactly compare one-to-one -one with the... Um, you know, I, I did. I went ahead and put the number that correlates with like the tarot people are familiar with. But as you can see, we're in a very different realm here. So we're looking at El Mato, which is the numerically the equivalent to the Fool, but not a lot similar other than the number zero. And uh, I think I'll probably be doing this as we go, but like trying to break into the meaning of the titles of these characters. Uh -huh. It's very interesting because there's not an equivalent in Latin or Italian with motto, but it is a conjugation in Spanish of the verb for to kill. And then in Hebrew, the word that refers to someone having died, which is mem, ta, uh, tav, and then yod would be, right. yeah, mat, motto. Kind of so, like their, their, new, uh, their new system for virtual reality. Meta, the metaverse <laughs> the motoverse <laughs> yeah yeah well i do have kind of like a harebrained stoner theory that language and symbolism is a metaverse of sorts because it does put this overlay on how we perceive nature mm -hmm. and if uh, we're confused about the symbolism and it's separate from how nature actually works then yeah you're basically in a virtual reality that doesn't have any semblance of the truth mm -hmm. He, yeah, he also has that not looking where he's going. <clears throat> you know, his legs are right. progressing to the left while his head is looking to the right. I love the fact that uh, the full card is often associated with the element of air. And so here on the left with Mato, you have a bird on his shoulder. And then, uh, you know, those could be feathers on his cap. And then it looks like he's playing some sort of bagpipe or windpipe. Right. And so there's that air symbolism. And then yeah, uh, when you look at the full card from the Crowley deck, uh, when we did the chaos presentation, I equated the full to chaos itself. And here you can just see, you know, obviously his hangs are close or uh, his clothes are hanging off of him. The background, you know, is just kind of messy and things like that. He has like loose socks, <laughs> I guess. And so uh, it kind of plays into that chaotic theme a little bit and uh, the air symbolism, too. He's got some buff legs, though. He did not skip sure. leg day. No, no. Um, so what it looks like is almost uh, the Calabrian shepherds. And we've talked about on the last time I was on here uh, with Gabe, Calabria being the first community of Pythagoreans. And the reason it's interesting is it looks like he's got a raven on his or a crow on his shoulder. I don't know if that's what it is, but that word comes from Kronos, which is crow, the knowledge or sorry, time and nos, gnosis, the knowledge of times, the knowledge of cycles. And so chronos, if you just switch the N with the R, uh, becomes corvus. It's an anagram. So it's a bird that represents time. And what I'm interested in is what is that little O in like around his waist with the two dots on either side? Because up there it looks like two, 
And that O almost looks like on, or like it almost like has like a Trinity vibe to it. And if it's to on or to theon, that would be basically the supreme being. Yeah. So the names zero. of the cards are kind of obscured, but here is the ma and the to. And so this would be the oh, okay. zero for gotcha. the numbering of the card. Gotcha. And so, yeah, zero, the seed. Well, the seed is Kronos, or Keres, Keren, and those Calabrian shepherds would go to Rome with their bagpipes at the winter solstice festivals. So it's the reckoning of the year, the cycle. Nice, nice. Um, also, I just want to say I do have uh, the deck on hand with the little booklet if we wanted a quick read of anything. And then I also have the Game of Saturn book that uh, you know is basically the main text that uh, has been written about this work. So if you guys want me to look into anything, I can. I've yeah, I was checking out before. that guy's oh. appearance on Higher Side Chats and... Uh, you know, I would really like to read that book. I might come to some different conclusions, but I appreciate the depth of time he spent researching it, like over three years. And the bagpipes to me is a very fascinating link because we know that that's also popular in Celtic areas, right? Further connecting the idea that the uh, Etrusians are Celtic, which are the Etrusians or Etruscans being the proto-Italians. Right. Uh, the other thing I've been thinking about lately with the full card is just the emphasis of the sun and, um, you know, just kind of thinking about astrology being a solar based system and that when you're tapping into the tarot, you are tapping into a, a solar based system. Now, I have some opinions about what maybe came before this solar based system, but it would make sense that the sun would be there nice and prominent on that full card on the right. And then obviously just that big wall of yellow there kind of uh, emphasizing that too, right? Yeah, and actually the black bird, you can make a strong case that the black bird is a solar symbol. I think Dylan would agree with that, that it could be a, a yuv or a dove. <laughs> yuv <laughs> could be a dove. Dylan, you want to expand on what I mean there? Well, yeah, like a uh, uh, dove in the Celtic means black. It would be spelled D-U-B-H. They pronounce that B H like a V, I believe. Something else I noticed though, Mato, if if it turns out not to be Spanish, but it very well very well might be Spanish. Um, it could be the cycle or circle or seed of Mat, which would be truth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's awesome, man. I love that. Maat, the feather of truth, you know, the air symbolism going on here, the bird symbolism. That's great. Mario, what's underneath the T-O? Is that, what, what, are those letters or is that just like, uh, it looks like almost like A-W-S on my end, but I can't see. You know, I think it's actually just part of the background. Oh, okay. But yeah, yeah. I'll look though. So the bagpipe is also, like maybe the fool carrying the bag is um, some kind of game of telephone corruption of the bagpipe, possibly. Uh -huh. I'm always thinking about the placenta. Every time I see every other He's full card. He's wearing ever, a red cloak. Yep. Every other full card I've ever looked at. Always got the bag, uh, which is, uh, you know, Perseus also has the purse on. It's the, it's that, uh, that hero's baggage. So the, oh, to like further flesh out that idea of the dove or the blackbird being a solar symbol, you see the dove with characters like Christ, right? On in a lot of artwork and symbolism. Um, and because there's that philological connection with the word black and you have Krishna meaning black and many of the savior deities, pretty much all of them in some capacity from Hercules to Jesus to Osiris are often depicted in black. If the, if it's a crow Corvus, which is as Dylan said, an anagram for Cronus, we also are aware that Cronus or Saturn before being ascribed as the name for the wandering star was a solar deity. And that makes a lot more sense for the symbolism of it being like, we know that in astrology and in divination system, Saturn deals with time, but in the natural world, in the most basic sense, the sun is your main reckoner of, of time reckoner of the year. 
Yeah, and just to add on to that, so you have Brahm, right? You have the 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 all, right? And then you have the three portions of the year, which would be Brahma Shiva, uh, sorry, Brahma Vishnu Shiva. Then um, what you have in in Rome is Bruma. So if you look at uh, Brumalia, B R U M A L I A, that's another festival of this winter time of the year, reckoning of the year. And you see that in all of it. So Brahm, you'd have um, Abram, you would have uh, Saturn, which the three portions of the year he marks would be uh, Pluto in the Roman pantheon. It would be Poseidon for, uh, I'm sorry, Neptune for spring, and then Jupiter for summer, and Pluto's death, winter. And then with the Greek pantheon, you'd have Kronos, uh, you'd have uh, Hades for hell, you'd have Poseidon for spring, and then you'd have Zeus for summer, the three portions of the year when it was when summer and when uh, autumn were the same seat, part of the same portion of the year. And so that hat he's wearing almost looks like wilted vegetation, which is a time of year when everything dies in winter. And I was going to ask Mario if he knew what those corded, those knotted or that corded rope means. Yeah, I was actually just going to bring that up. So if you look at this card, we're skipping ahead here, but it'll illustrate what it represents. And so this is uh, Neroni, number eight. And when I was looking into this card uh, a while back, when I did research on what those balls are on that cord, it's actually, uh, my understanding is that it's a toy for a toddler, essentially. Um, something that you would put over their crib or something that you'd play with with them. And so to me, that actually kind of makes sense that you would see that in this card because uh, this is like, you know, the beginning of the major arcana, you know, so he's raw and he's new to this journey and everything else. So I think there's a childlike um, symbolic play going on with that. Well, the reason I asked is because it looks like something that you would climb in steps. Interesting. You know, like in gym, whether it's in gym class or whatever else, I don't know. And if in it's three like parts. A... Right, right. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, kind of there's like a little bookend going on here with something else that you can climb on the left. You know, I know it's more kind of like an abstract tree or something like that, but it kind of gives me a similar vibe, I guess. And also, I will say, yep, for sure. Um, you know, one interesting thing about this deck that you will notice is that there's actually a lot of subliminal uh, encodes in this whole entire deck. So you really have to look at it with a very, very skeptical eye, and you have to look at everything. Like, nothing is um, unintentional. Everything is very, very strategic. So as an example, notice that his ass looks like it could potentially be exposed. There is so much homoerotic symbolism in this deck, it kind of blows the mind a little bit. And there's little things like that that you'll see throughout the whole entire series of cards that we're going to look at. So to me, that is absolutely intentional. You guys see how his shoulder looks like the Raven's almost tearing it? It doesn't look like it's just landing on it. It looks like it's pulling the flesh a little bit. Yeah, and one, uh, right. at my cursory glance at this deck, it does seem very death-centric, which it sets it apart from a lot of the other tarots. I, I'm interesting, too, about him being new, if you rearrange the letters of Mato, you could get Atom, which would yeah. be Adam. Yeah. And even totally. the name of Adam has philological connections to alternate names for Cronus or Saturn. So, you know, what a what's his name? Peter, what was it? The guy who did that book, Mario? Peter Mark Adams. Peter Mark Adams, what he puts forward in interviews, I've heard with him talking about this. And thank you, Gabe, for refreshing us in the uh, Interverse chat with the Higher Side Chat episode he did four years ago. His whole uh, theory about the deck is that it's encoding the information passed by the secret priesthood of how to reincarnate strategically and make sure that you reincarnate into the same type of family line that you left so that you can come back into power and not basically it's about like learning to control the uh, metempsychosis process. Now, whether or not that's an accurate hypothesis or if that's even something that's possible, I don't know, but it is, to me, I don't put that out of the realm of possibility if reincarnation is real. Um, you know, I'm 
I'm open to that idea as a possibility. So I would like to keep that idea in mind as we go forward as well, that this is a character in the motto card here that is possibly um, doing something that's allowing him to prepare for that next step uh, or that there's some relation to that idea going on. Yeah, that makes tons of sense. Also, your boy, uh, was is it Jorge? The guy uh, who said... Uh, he just goes by George. Oh, but George. You would, makes you want to say Jorge with the J. Yeah. Probably the, doesn't mind. The He also noted about the bag, bagpipe connection in India. Oh, yeah. How that's also very similar to like other droney instruments that that is a interesting link that could definitely be a... Well, I mean, we have enough strikes to know that there's a connection between the Celts and the Phoenicians and the Indians and the Egyptians, but that's definitely another one. And also, isn't uh, the the history of the deck is very Mithraically uh, steeped, as I understand it, right? A lot of the Mithraic initiation rites are also encoded in the deck, uh, which which means we've got, you know, military orders where the guys are away from the ladies for long periods of time, and there's only guys with guys. That's right. Yep, exactly. So that's kind of part of the culture it's coming out of also. 100%. Yeah. That's my understanding, too. Also, just because the full card makes it so obvious, um, just notice the amount of um, staffs and and uh, swords and how they're used. Um, scepters and, and things like that and pillars and, and everything. It's just it's throughout this whole entire deck. When I was looking through it today, I was reminded that it's just all over the place. So that's something that'll be repeated throughout. Yeah, you guys want to move forward to the next one? Or Mario, if you ever want me to pull up your version of the of uh, slides to let me know. I think your first one started a little later into the Arcana, but it'd be fun to just sort of go yeah. through these. Yep, for sure. Let's go through it. Maybe with the fourth card, we can switch over. Uh, just okay, for cool. that card. Yeah. Yeah, the Mario. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Okay, so the magician alternative here is Panphilio, which if you go with a Greek eye to this, you have Pan, which would be all, and then uh, Philos, which is love or loved. So this is a character referring to, like the name is referring to one who is loved by all or a friend to everybody, beloved, very like balder feeling type of name. Right. Yeah, or like a fact, lover of Pan, you know, if we're talking about Pan oh yeah, the deity. For sure. <laughs> um, the fact that he's making a one with his hand, I think is kind of interesting since this is card number one. I don't know if I personally make the direct correspondence, right, between the magician and this card. Uh, but I would love to just point out that it's really strange. I am very, very curious uh, if anyone has written anything about this, but a lot of their shields appear to have been destroyed. And so I'm assuming that there's a coat of arms here or there's some indication linking it to some family or what have you. But a lot of the shields have been, it looks to me like they've been strategically scratched off. Unless maybe they used a different sort of method, printing method for the shields, like a um, gold flake or something like that. Uh, but I think that's very curious. So I think there's something being covered up with those shields and then, of course, uh, right underneath the one, it just looks like a blue penis, basically. One of many throughout the deck. Not well, necessarily if you look right here, Mario, under his elbow, it's like they didn't scratch off that part, if if what you say is accurate. Yeah, that's just my hunch. So this this definitely, for me, uh, brings forward the uh, Berserker. Uh, in Norse mythology, the Berserker was the warrior who was eating the top of their shield because they're so eager for battle. And so uh, the tooth marks, they're literally their tooth would uh, be consuming the top of the shield, just like his arm is kind of covering up that gnawed off aspect. So the berserkers were, um, they were like were bears. They were shapeshifters. They believed that they turned into bears in battle. And so uh that's something I see iconically. Yeah, and I think there may be something to the way the 
words are displayed on the card where you have pan, feel, and then yo by itself over here. Uh -huh. Giving you a 10 as well. Very interesting. Um, in terms of the shield, another aspect of it that could be going on, like assuming maybe it wasn't scratched off or in some way defaced to hide a family crest, but that's a, I mean, that's a really valid theory though. Um, depends on, I'm not exactly sure what kind of artifact we're dealing with here. Were these engravings that were recovered or they definitely weren't playing cards like you'd get from Toys R Us. <laughs> so how that works, I'm not sure Mario might be able to elucidate, but uh, we're going back to solar sim symbolism with a shield because that is a disc. And, you know, the the disc or the shield is long-standing correlation to the, also the uh, the bloodline families, especially if you go into Pierre Sabak's work. He does a good job demonstrating that. So for the solar symbol of the shield to be defaced or damaged or destroyed, that could be, again, back to the seeming theme of winter or death or, you know, destruction aspect of the Trinity and how Kronos would be the sun in winter, typically, that we're looking at, like, you know, the shield is destroyed, the, the disc is, the solar disc is weakened. Something along those lines comes to my mind. Well, let me add that um, you have filio, right? But in Latin, filius is sun, S-O-N. And that's associated with Jesus and the symbolism of the ichthys. So there might be some of that in code, especially when you have Jesus basically replacing Pan. As uh, Robert Taylor wrote, Christianity and paganism are about as different from each other as six and half a dozen. <laughs> Mm. What about his knee covering? And, you know, <laughs> this looks like a dong, his, his sword scabbard. <laughs> there's definitely there's definitely that going on. And, you know, I, I did put the, I say traditional. The thing about the tarot is there is no official tarot. That doesn't exist. But the one most familiar to everyone would be the writer. And as we go forward, you'll see that there's like almost no resemblance between most of them. Right, right. Some of them you have to look um, pretty closely uh, and you have to really decode to find the similarities, which I think there's a few that I have in my slideshow that'll show you like the direct correspondence. Um, and once you have the eyes to see it, it'll become obvious. But yeah, this one doesn't necessarily translate for sure. Mario. Oh, look at that. Nice. Uh, Luke Renda's uh, photo is really nice. I like that. Um, Mario, does any of your card, like the information, say what's on his knee? Is that like a tradition of like a warrior, like attaching some sort of, I don't know, you know it looks like a flower, but the fact that it doesn't have any color, it's like, what is it? Right, right. I haven't come across anything. Um, it could be in the Game of Saturn book somewhere, okay. but it's been a while since I've uh, looked into it. But that is curious, though. There's a number of those throughout the whole entire deck. We also have the fact that he's not wearing pants. And, you know, his skirt is flaring up here. So we have more exposing of the ass potentially. And the knee pad, you know, maybe is for getting on his knees because he's not wearing pants to protect his, his knees. I know that's kind of gutter thoughts, but I'm pretty sure that that's a, a, there's a there there in terms of the overall themes in all these cards. Have you guys ever seen um, the inscription on the stone in the Olmec sites called the traveler. No. Oh. So this is found and it looks like a bearded European. And this is one of the oldest sites in Mexico. Um, and what's interesting is they say it, they've, they've alluded it to it being Phoenician. And that that's like, you know, that's how some of these uh, like Southern Mexicans, um, especially around the Isthmus of America, there were white Indians and their language had an affinity to the Highland language in the UK. And what's curious is this purple Phoenician looking ribbon. I mean, if you were to look at the Justinian code during these times, you would be put to death for wearing Syrian purple like that. So the fact that this guy could be wearing that doesn't make any sense. Unless he is royalty. 
Well, he has sure. a crown, but it's like yeah. a spiky crown of thorns thing. So and there isn't really any Christian iconography going on in here. But like you said, <laughs> or in the words of Robert Taylor, Christianity and paganism are uh, virtually identical. Well, when you talk about pan and translating it to the all, the all is mind, God, it all is the same idea encoded in that. So, yeah, I like what Marty says about it that <laughs> there's no the, the reason why you get to the core of any tradition, any mythology, any language and find the same thing going on is because it's nobody's symbolism. We're talking about God's language. That's what it means with the logos. If it is an accurate descriptor of nature and the creation, then no culture owns that, right? So we don't need yeah. to worry about whose it is or if you're not special anymore because you find out that your chosen tradition is uh, sharing ideas and themes and symbols and meaning with other ones and all of them essentially at their root. Yeah, that could be part of what is, you know, this could be a veiled reference to the occulted generative source of the work itself. You know, the fact that his, his crotch is veiled by the shield. Right, right. Yeah. The shield uh, is also a vesica shape in terms of generation. Sure. Mm -hmm. Dylan, I'm really glad you brought up the Traveler uh, because I think that actually unlocks the correspondence with the Magician card because the traditional correspondence with the Magician is Mercury um, being the messenger of the gods, the Traveler. My personal opinion is, you know, you see the wand that is uh, being held above. He's making the as above, so below relationship. Um, you know, he's the psychopomp. He's the guide of souls. And so... When I look at the one and I look at the pole, the pillar, the post, I see a bridge to the other side personally. And so I think he goes up and down, you know, uh, this stairway to heaven, if you will. And so here, what we have with the Solabuska is he is traveling and he's pointing forward. So he is making that journey, you know, so maybe there's a subliminal sort of psychopomp journey of the soul kind of going on here, which is very much part of uh, mercurial symbolism as it relates to the magician. Is so. that magician's belt a serpent? It is. Yep. Well, there you go. Version. Cycles. Cycles yeah, yeah. of the sun. Right. And that actually brings up something that I wanted to put forward as a hypothesis. I would need to do more work on this deck to prove it. But I think that one of the things that being encoded here is the cycle called the Neros. And Maybe I just want to put that out there as an idea and a possibility to keep in the back of our minds as we go forward that we might see that in the Nero cycle. You know, the amount of time of the cycle has changed from time to time throughout history as the priests realized they were wrong and tried to do some alterations and then realized they were wrong again and did, did some more alterations. But it's generally, you know, different periods of time, a 600 year cycle, a 608 year cycle. At one point, it was like 666 years, depending on the place and the time. And knowing about this is helpful because it can help you see how different cults in different cultures were really sprung from the same source. Because otherwise, why would they have the same astronomical errors in their belief system, especially if they were places and peoples who didn't even have the observational capacity to uh, make those conjectures, right? So with the Neros, one of the things believed about it was that at each new Nero cycle commencing, that a new incarnation of the sun would be born as like a messiah or savior. So one thing that could be encoded in this deck, some of the characters or maybe all of them could be walking us through maybe some closely guarded secret in occult tradition describing the lineage of those messiah characters or saviors or neros throughout time well it's funny that you're talking about that because there's a card that's nerone oh yeah which is black <laughs> yes so there you right, go right. krishna black that's what right, and if you drop if you swap black. the r to the l and it's close to nile yep nilo nilo yep. which is also black or nil zero also, uh, I feel like it's worth mentioning that pretty much the consensus is that this deck was more than likely created with uh, malefic 
intentions for black magical purposes you know of a system that maybe is kind of little known or understood sort of thing so um that's something to kind of keep in mind too as we just kind of cruise through everything here yeah that was definitely made clear by uh peter mark adams and i've been thinking a lot about that like uh I'm seeing a lot of very interesting things being encoded in the Crowley Thoth deck. And uh, I reading about, you know, Lady Frida Harris's intentions with that deck. And she actually says it's not for, she didn't mean it for divination, divination. She meant for its meaning to unfurl slowly over time. And I think she's talking about those outer ring planets in those longer arc uh, changes and shifts in the collective. Um, so, the fact that you mentioned that it's malefic, I think that's an interesting thing to consider. Uh, I, I'm kind of seeing the same thing in other decks. Well, especially yeah. if it's like a chrono, a Cronian Chronos version of the sun being encoded, because that is when the sun is malefic. It is destroying all the vegetation, and we see a lot of wilted and dead and barren landscapes pretty much on every card. And there's a lot, so there's a lot of this like dead earth thing going on. And I'm not the guy to like back this up, but I do think from what I think I know that there's a a tradition in those regions of Italy and the Venetians and the prior civilizations of like Chthonic magic where certain family lines were um, collaborating with, at least in their belief and maybe effectively, don't, we don't know, with some kind of, um, you know, demonic type energies or entities hey two things um because benjamin balderson just sent uh said something about mirrors do you know that that's a shield or could that be like some sort of mirror or something else like a table i don't know i'm just throwing yeah we don't know yeah i don't really know i would think that if it were a mirror it does look like there's some sort of design that was at one point on it you know but perhaps that could be the case for sure i know mirrors have been used in warfare before well what about that um it almost looks like his elbows blocking a ship and there's like a mast or something in the background. Is that a mistake? Or like, what, do you know what that is? I think it's his finger. He's like pointing forward. No, no, no. On his right, his, his uh, left elbow, there's like a straight line. What yeah. is that? Yeah. I'm not sure what this is. Um, my understanding, I could be wrong. Please correct me if this is the case, but uh, I think there was only one surviving deck and I don't think that they had the actual engravings. So it was one complete deck um and that is very rare i mean there's famous tarot decks where uh, the actual some of the actual cards had to be reproduced in the same style as when it was created um and so i think that we're just looking at you know one deck that has survived all of these centuries and so i think there's little discrepancies and kind of things going on here and there so that's my understanding but who knows there could be really subliminal stuff going on like that <laughs> that would not shock me so I'm going to move us forward here to card number two. Nice. Postumio, which is, that is a Latin word. And I think we all know what posthumous means. <laughs> right. Well, the secret about this card is that actually that is the figure there. That is his head on the pedestal. Notice that he, he doesn't have a neck or a head. It's just a hat with hair. It's and so skull. I think that's the subliminal. Yeah, that's his skull. And he's wearing the Phrygian cap, which is a, it's a, sim, you know, it's covered. That's what the Jacobins used and Masons, you know, and like when they were doing those, uh, the French Revolution, cover your head in that cap. In it's worth more, it's worth, yeah, it's worth more than a king's crown. Um, and ironically, the crown is on the, the brick pillar. But look at the, look at the top there. You have an eight pointed star, which is going to go back to Buddhism, the Dharmic wheel, if you will. And then is that a palm tree? Because that, if it is, yes, that's it usually, is. Like palm, that's usually yeah. representative, at least in Egypt, of uh, the year. And it's on a shield or a disc. Yeah, I see it as the world tree uh, for sure, which obviously has uh, connotations um, with the year. But uh, yeah, that and was... it could be a, it could be a star at the top, like you know Polaris or the pole star right. of the time, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And there's writing on it, and I can't make out. Exactly, but it looks like it says or fatis. 
but I definitely can't tell for sure on the first two letters. It kind of looks like an R here, and this looks like F I F A T I S. Maybe over the fates, above the fates, or the and, and down here we can have you zoom like in a, or no? Yeah, I think I can. He's also he's occulting an X. Oh, Patty's father. Okay, oh. above the fathers. Something. Maybe Jupiter Patis or something. So, I don't know. It could be an F. It could be a P. What the, there were there Fs in Latin though. Um, I don't think so. And down here we have what looks like kind of a triple wilted flower fleur de lis thing. Very interesting too how we're seeing so many of the characters already with their back turned. Yes, that's right. That's one thing to keep in mind. And uh, that does look like a torch, uh, a torch that's being pointed down. And when you look into Mithraic artwork, a lot of times you'll see two figures on the side. One has a torch pointed upward. The other one has a torch pointed downward. Lots of different things ab about what they could encode. A lot of people associate them with uh, kind of Gemini symbolism, twin symbolism. Um, a lot of sun symbolism too, the rising sun, setting sun, things like that. But I think it's interesting, the, the downward torch. And yeah, you're totally right, Slick, the, uh, the X. And obviously on the right-hand side, it looks like another penis, right? Yeah, a, a red one. It's a, yeah, reds versus blues. Left Coke versus Pepsi. <laughs> okay, uh, so Cody's saying F used to be, the letter F used to be the letter P. P. Is okay. that accurate? So Pottis. Yeah, but also it was like an early, it's like corresponds to the die gamma, but that shit was dropped. So, like, maybe like early on it was because they're go If you, you know, that episode I did with Crow today, it, I talk about how early on the, the Greek and the Latin was basically the same alphabet. But I don't think it was used like in later times. So, I dug out my uh, seven ranks of the Mithraic order. And some of it might correspond with these cards in their order, but the first one is a raven. The, right. the, the, Let the, me correct myself real quick. Yeah, Fratter. Yeah. Fratter. Of course it's used. Fratter means brother in my mind. Brotherhood. I mean, yeah. Okay. But it's, it's funny that you thought, thought made me think of that because I was like, oh shit, do they use Fs? It's not many. Not many. They do, but it's not many words with F. Nice. So yeah, the, this is the fraternal order of the Mithraic Brotherhood. So the, the first rank is a raven, and then it turns into a nymph, and then a soldier, and then lion, a Persian, a sun runner, or a helion driver, and then pater is the final seventh step. So maybe we'll see that expressed through as we go up in the numbers. Nice. Thanks for pulling that out, dude. You guys have anything else on this one? You want to move on? Uh, you know, the barren climate is something, right, that you see just continued here. So that is interesting. But yeah, I think we can move on. Uh, real quick, Pati in uh, Sanskrit means master or lord. So I don't know if there's anything there to say. Uh -huh. Nice. So I couldn't find any correlate to this word. Lenpio. Oh my gosh. But I have Lion is the next rank in the Mithraic order. L I O N. And we have right. another, we have a red shield now. And we're continuing the theme with purple being involved as well. Right. Yeah. There's a few things. I, I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Would love to know what's in his hand. Obviously, it looks like he's covering up potentially his left eye specifically, maybe. Um, and then obviously I'm curious, you know, what's going on with that bowl down below? I just spitballing here, but I wonder if that is the Starfire or the like psychedelic concoction that the was used involving like menstrual blood. Since mm. we're on the Empress here, I mean, right. Obviously, there's not necessarily a correlation between these two, but 
one would think there could be some kind of link. So it does have blood in it, right? I I mean, I think that that's got to be blood in there. It looks like that's the case, yeah. So I, yeah. So I think uh, we probably have a good match for uh, for the decapitation ritual uh, here on uh, Herodotus. The histories. Let's see. We've got the same thing going on. I'm pulling the Gordy here. Yep. <laughs> gotcha. Looks like almost the you know the same color, same style. Uh, so this is when uh, Sir, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Cyrus. When Cyrus gets decapitated uh, in the wars. And it kind of sparks off a uh, Alexander the Great's uh, comeuppance against the Persians. I'm wondering if there's some kind of Ceres thing going on. Like, is this wheat or is that hair? I'm also wondering about Odin sacrificing his eye. And also like the the modern black eye symbolism that we see, see from the, the modern versions of these occult of these cults. Right. Right. A red flag for me when I'm like researching something is when you like, I just typed in Lempio with like Google scholar, everything, and nothing comes up except this deck that usually means it's just this. And so then you would say, well, who, why would they do that? Is it an anagram? Is it a numerological encode? So I would do the numerology on that and see if it adds up and corresponds to any cycles or anything like that, because it might be something like that. Yeah, we should do that on the fly. <laughs> Maybe somebody can help us with that. Yeah, I mean, this it's very mysterious. Um, it kind of made me think of limpia in Spanish, which is like cleaning. To clean, mm-hmm. Right, right. It does say here that there are no known historical references for this one. So a lot of these cards are based off of actual historical figures, supposedly. And some of them look exactly like what they're supposed to look like, which is really interesting. I have one such example in my slides. Um, Also, just want to point out this very obvious poll that's basically kind of dividing uh, the canvas, you know, and then with uh, the artwork around the pole to me just implies kind of this upward or downward movement depending on how you look at it so and then she's obviously holding a wand of sorts too yeah and generally when you see that it's like if you look at like the origin of like the letter i you're you're looking at the boundary between uh the tropic of cancer and the tropic of um or the equator excuse me gotcha yeah, it's interesting, actually. Uh, I don't know if you've ever checked out the box saga, but uh, their take is fascinating. And they're saying that the lowercase i is the world axis central pole, and the dot on top of the i is actually the pole star, which I think is kind of curious. It's actually from, if you look at like the priest class, it's actually the encode of uh, Io, first name for the sun, the first glyph for the sun, the priest's finger pointing at the sun. Nice, nice. And, and I did. I box did saga. This. No offense to anybody who likes the box saga. You need to look into that. The is worse than Crowley. <laughs> <laughs> the, the guy is uh, quite a character, and I, my problem with the box saga is just that you know we're taking one person's word for it without any real like lineage of philological or etymological backing you know it's what it's basically all bottleneck the one guy so whether or not he's right i can't base my claims on that and uh it's so it's in a lot of ways dissonant to things that are more easily verifiable so i just have kind of stayed away from it but i did run lempio through just an ordinal gematria and i got 71 so that definitely encodes a cycle Mm mm-hmm Anybody want to take a stab at which one? Uh, no, just want to say I'm neither here to promote uh, nor uh, 
basically deny anything that's going on in the box saga. So I just think it's very <laughs> curious. I, we come from different places. So, you know, I figured the the solar versus polar thing would come up at some point. And so um, there is a thing where obviously people who follow my work know that like, you know, things related to the North, the North Pole, the Pole Star or some major minor, that is absolutely my jam. So anyone who talks about that, I'm at the least, at the very least curious to see kind of what's going on there. So the Northern symbolism aspect, I, I don't think can really, to me personally, be ignored. So I think a lot of solar symbolism is like an updated um, sort of language of things that maybe kind of came before it. And so when we're looking at astrology, it's the ecliptic, it's the path of the sun. And it's like, you know, there were other methods of sky clocks, you know, before astrology. Well, we also know that the priesthood would encode things five different ways or more that something could very easily mean more than one thing. The sun yeah, goes from true. north to south. That That's the seasons. That's like what's going to be... Um, depicted right so or what's it's going to affect our lives the most right so even though it goes from uh east to west if you look at it like right now like i'm in the 40th degree of north latitude it literally streaks across the southern sky because we're in winter and when it's in summertime it's like almost it looks it's way north so that is the symbolism when you see that going from the between the tropics some of the crosses, like the crosses of like Lorraine and stuff, you'll see those like three hash marks on it. That's going to encode both tropics and the equator, right? So if you were to look at like this symbolism, Bacchus being the triumph, triumphalos, the triple navel, that would be the middle of the construct, whether you want to look at it as a globe or you want to do the flat earth model. Those are the three key parts in the middle of the construct. Triumph, tri umphalos, navel, yoni, womb, whatever. That's Bacchus, the sun. Yeah, who is also a character in this deck. And uh, one of the reasons why I brought up the possibility of the Nero's cycle being encoded and the heroes or saviors, sons of God being born in the closing or beginning of those cycles is because, uh, especially with the, the royals, like the court cards in this deck, they are actually depicting historical or pseudo historical figures from Roman history, many of which, uh, you know, I'm working on it. It's a big task, but I'm, you know, looking to someday maybe bring forward a more of a presentation on like demonstrating a lot of the astro theology and the Nero cycle that is masquerading as ancient history in not just Rome, but like all over the place. So you guys want to get into the, uh, the Mario? <laughs> Because this one's very interesting. Let's do it. Yeah. This is this is why Mario likes this deck. Let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and look at who it is. If it isn't Agmios, Mercury, Odin, Jesus, Thoth, Tutates, all of them. So, all in one. Is this number four? Lord Yo. Yeah, number, number four. four. Yeah. So this corresponds with the Emperor card. And it makes a lot of sense. There is Mars energy here. You know, there's Aries energy here. And so that those are the traditional correspondences, right, with the Emperor card, uh, Mars and Aries. Here, actually, you can see that the shield is more intact for whatever reason. Um, and so the thing that really that I noticed right off the bat was his sword, mainly the placement of the sword, very phallic, right? Um, it looks like also, I mean, I hate to say it cause this is my card, uh, but there is some, uh, homoerotic stuff going on. It's like, where's that branch, you know, located. Right. And so if you just progress to the next slide, I think it kind of explains. Well, I mean, it. just how is he sitting like that? <laughs> yeah. That too. Right. I mean, he's gotta be posted up on something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, but you know, the, the handle of the sword I thought it was very curious. <laughs> right, so we have to go back. Oh, you know. I can't look out. No, it's <laughs> so it looks like the symbol. super chat Owen Benjamin right now. <laughs> Pay the gay away. And so uh, the handle looks like uh, the symbol for Aries, which I actually uh, think is fascinating because it looks a lot like the Magen Shield or Megan Shield, which is uh, a shield or a tool used in circumcision rituals. So I'm like, what are the odds that it kind of looks like a mage and shield? And castration, and also, right? Full on castration too, right? 
Uh, I'm not sure about that. Maybe. I mean, isn't that what this symbolizes? That tool. I mean, circumcision uh, is is how is the tool that it's actually used for for the process of circumcision. You know, so I'm pretty sure you put it around the penis, and then you have a scalpel sort of thing, and you're using that shield to kind of guide you uh, around the head. And so uh, I think that that's an encode that's definitely going on here. Um, once again, corresponds with the Emperor card, therefore Aries and Mars. And so um, just thought I would point that one out. Do you guys know what's on his shield? I don't know. By the way, for those who don't know the origin of Mars, it comes from Phoenician, Maur, which means Lord, Great, or Prince. So Mars is a title for the sun. I'm going to go grab uh, my John McHugh book one second. It's in the other room. <laughs> there's yeah, a, yeah, go for it. There's something I've highlighted in there that I want to bring forward about that subject too. Sure. Man, what a trip. Yeah. Uh, always something about chopping dicks with these guys. I tell you what. <laughs> like, you know, and but let's think about it. Okay, so we're we're living back in the day and we're just now uh, uh getting other soldiers acquainted with how to handle your sword and the sword generally dangles around your junk and so think about how commonplace the mythology and the joking and the razzing to tell the new guy be careful where you let your sword swing you know what i mean <laughs> right. there, there's there's like probably entire culture built up around how to carry yourself when you got a sword strapped to your to your waist yeah and then you have jesus which is basically jesus and these it literally and jesus uh going back to like syrian and stuff and they all mean or allude to like powerful in war or great in war so it, it is really interesting but i would love to know what that shield is if anything that's the one that looks like they carved up a little bit to like hide the meaning it looks like it's got a map like a land bridge map ah uh, interesting so one thing that's interesting is the uh the constellation that the greeks called okeanos or ocean that we would call ocean the god ocean i found out from this book celestial code of scripture by john McHugh that the mesopotamian name for that constellation and deity was Maratu, Mar, M-A-R, so ocean again. And uh, there's more to that, but we'll save it for when I talk to John later on. We have something in the call-in line I want to bring forward. It goes back to the previous slide, but uh, maybe shed some light on it. Thank you, PK, for this share. So this is from Peter Mark Adams, but he's saying the, uh, this card number three representing the opening of a right to address a Catonic deity, like I was mentioning. And, you know, it's anecdotal, but I have heard, I definitely have heard stories of people interacting with these Catonic deities from, you know, following the traditions of these uh, ancient Venetian and prior families and cults and having shit happen <laughs> and getting kind of like bound into service to something in a very freaky way. Uh, there's a recent mysterious universe episode where they covered a guy's book talking about his life story with that. But this is an interesting word. Proskinesis. Wow. But, but doesn't that sound like I uh, I don't know. Sounds like prosthetics. Doesn't it kind of? Proskinesis. That's a, a good bit, share, yeah. though. Thank you for that. Uh, people, don't forget we have a call-in line it on means, Telegram. Oh. oh, go ahead. It means like genuflecting, like bowing. Oh, okay. Um, also, that's chance, what the that, curtsy is about. Yeah, Oke Okeanos. Okay. You have Anos the year, right? But if you look at it, he's got that kind of like that serpentine, but he's also black. And, you know, he's got that fish in his right hand, a serpent in his left hand. And everybody, you know, another name for Buddha. And he is dog po. Here, he's, you know, the constellation of ocean is at the Pisces fish, the southern Pisces fish. And, and dog is going to be fish. So that's where you have dog on, dog po, Buddha. It's another name for Buddha. 
So it's all, and it's backwards. It's God, the Godites, if you will, which is basically God. And I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, God was also referencing uh, Aries in uh, some of those Eastern cultures. I think India somewhere. I could be wrong, though. That's been a long time. Yeah, that never ends. That's an endless rabbit hole. Uh, I'm going to take us back to, let's get on to, we want to say anything else about Mario here? That's an interesting card. He does have the feathers or the, the winged cap that is a mer mar curial thing going on and what and well just the, the fact flag. that it's four and there's four seasons i don't know if that's related but like the four cardinal points of the year i don't know mm -hmm. what were at the end of those branches what are those like puffy things do you guys know that i'm assuming it's like the veg leafy vegetation coming off of yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yep. But it's bizarre because so far it's the first kind of sign of life on any of these plants that we've seen. But it looks like it's, you know, at the end of its life cycle. It's definitely not green. That could be some kind of a remnant of the printing process or the art style. Maybe they couldn't really do a lot of green. But green is suspiciously missing from this. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of how... When I used to go to a lot of like big festivals and electronic music shows. I noticed a theme of a lot of the larger acts where their like their visualizers and their screens had all kinds of like weird, uh, very <laughs> chthonic symbolism going on. That green would be absent sometimes. Like more often than not, they'd have every color, flashing lights, strobing, aliens monsters demons all kinds of stuff going on on the screen and never green so i don't know what that's about other than green representing like the middle and the heart and life so one point before we shift over the flag he's holding that tiny undersized flag over the shoulder uh is reminiscent to me of the uh sun card which generally has a perseus uh, waving a flag of some sort uh, and the sun card is often also in Aries in the station of Aries and that figure with that hat is going to be related to communication eloquence messages and um, that flag is very similar to what the traveler is carrying in the Olmec inscription not that they're related. I just think it's interesting because he's wearing the Syrian purple again. Yeah. And it's a very flag um, flag language. I don't know what you'd call it, but like there's Herald an entire tree. language to waving flags in certain ways and what colors you show and all that too. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just have to point out too uh, with flag symbolism, I think when you're placing that pole into the ground, you're, you're, um, you're claiming land. It's no different than when you have sex with a woman, you're claiming land. So you're putting something phallic into the ground the same way when you put, in my opinion, obelisks, standing stones, things of that sort. Towers. Victory towers, columns. Yeah. Oh, and, hey, Mario, what is that I in think the it's top? All uh, re uh, sorry, representative of the axis, Mundi, of the world axis, of the world pillar. Do you, you guys know? know what that represents in the top left corner? It looks like a planet or something, like the moon or something. It's like a depiction. Oh, yeah, Mercury, the moon, because I think in alchemy. I think it could either be, uh, it could be Mars, to... too, perhaps. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe they would have made it more red. With the flag symbolism as well, in Egypt, the hieroglyph, one of the hieroglyphs for the Netur or the Netru or the gods or god was a flag. So whenever they had like the Vexalum, or the post with the, the cloth on it, it would usually be a symbol for God because it's the wind, the breath that is animating or making the flag move. It's like, you know, that's said thought to be a very divine thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely, dude. For sure. <laughs> Luke Renda said in the chat, these guys didn't skip leg day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got some beefy legs. In a while, a while back, we, uh, we corresponded the flags, not only with the North Star, but also with the, the flagon, like a vessel, something that you, uh, you fill it with meaning. 
and you lift it up in uh, salute as a, you know, a salute to, you know, the other soldiers. Um, but also the two, uh, the dippers, the two dippers are two vessels lifted up uh, like two cups or two flagons uh, as though you're cheersing the heavens symbolically. And you also have flagellation. Nice. All right. Even at Which the top is a of very the, uh, priestly thing to do. And an offering. A spilling at the top of most flagpoles, you have that little bulb there. You know, it makes me wonder if that's the North Star. I'm a little concerned also how Mario doesn't have a beard. Hashtag just saying, <laughs> Yeah, what's up with that? Because oh. in the Emperor, he's like on point, right? Nobody wants to fuck with that guy. He's got like the staff of Osiris and everything, but uh, in this one. Yeah, it's know. a very like boyish and effeminate face. Yeah, that's a great point. It's true. Another good share from PK, crushing it in the call in line. Uh, back to that proskinesis, uh, the you know that idea of genuflecting before the ruler. He pulled up this image of. I'm thinking this is the image that goes with the Wikipedia entry for that word. But I'm seeing definitely some like Mesopotamian looking carving here and a similar pose to what we had over on the, um, I lost it, but this kind of similar pose maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And it pertains to Persian. Oh, that was, yeah, this is Persian. Okay. Right. So that brings up another interesting point. Uh, they're both seated. Right. Uh, obviously, in the rider weight version, he's clearly throned. Very, very stable. Uh, he actually, in the rider weight version, if you want to pull that up again, um, I think that what they're encoding to is that the emperor is subliminally the world mountain. And so here you can see two mountains to the sides of him. And then here, clearly, he makes up the third central mountain, in my opinion. So kind of like a Mount Maru sort of thing at the north is kind of what I pick up, at least. Mm hmm. So, Catullo, what do we make of our card number five here? That is definitely not a hierophant, or is it? What is this that she is holding? Uh, so, the cut, the, you know, definitely vibes with the, the Catholic of the hierophant, but also uh, Hakate. Uh, is Artemis, uh, who changed into a cat, so it has that potentially. You think that's a female? It could be. Uh, mm -hmm. Cat Catullo is also a, a poet of ancient Rome. Gaius Valerius Catullo. Also, uh, it pulls up a puppy too, like dog, and. Um... Are those, are those scales? Is that a scale? Like weighing of the, the you know, kind of like that Ma'at thing? It or gives like off Virgo, that vibe. Virgo yeah. with the scales? Yep. And we have like a very conch-esque shape going on here on the hat, like a shell. And the shield, the placement of the shield is very strange. It's almost like like the leg is up, up in a strange way. And it's almost like the shield is cutting the leg off and it's a red leg. Really, well, it's really like she's right. it's like she's crouching with it. Yeah. Well, what's right. that on the right? Like, what is is that her like, bare leg or? Is yeah, that I wonder else? if she's wounded. Is that a wound right there? I've never noticed actually. Uh, the one thing I'll point out too is that the hierophant card uh, corresponds with Taurus, right, and therefore Venus too. Venus also uh, rules Libra, if that is a Libra reference here with the scales. Um, and remember so how Taurus, I was telling you, oh, sorry, uh, no, go for it. Remember how I was telling you that cross of Lorraine type thing with the three hashes you yeah. see here in the Hierophant? That's what that is. The, the, that's the, those marks are the, uh, the middle ones, the equator, the other ones are the tropics. So I was going to bring up that cross actually, uh, because it reminds me whenever Taurus comes around, I think of the Tau and the Tau cross, the T. And so here you have both of the figures holding some sort of cross, you know, and those those keys of St. Peter are unmistakable. Those are the keys of Janus, the kingdom of heaven, the beginning and end of the year, or the gate of the year. 
So one encode that people have kind of come up with, I made a video about it, but uh, oftentimes there's silver and uh, golden, right? A silver key and a golden key. So some people have said that uh, these are keys to gateways. Um, there's so many different, you know, ways of looking at the night sky and, and, you know, people claim that there's portals and gateways all over the place, but uh, Aldebaran, when you're looking towards Aldebaran, which is the eye of the bull in Taurus, you're looking away from the center of the galaxy. When you're looking at Antares, the heart of Scorpio, you're looking towards the center of the galaxy. And so some people have said that uh, this, these keys are symbolic of these two gateways, which have been called the golden and silver gates as well. Well, well, but that's unmistakable. You're looking at like the triple crown of Baal. That's a pope. He's wearing the same garbs. You can look up. I mean, this is this is unmistakable. St. Peter or the, the pope. Even with sure. the symbol of bene layers benediction, stuff, though, right? Well, I don't know. There if are. You don't, if you don't know the artist, what their intention is, then you, you can make that claim. It's subjective. But that Peter, Janus, Pope symbolism, sun symbolism right there, it's all in line with the rigid system of the church. So. I don't know. I wouldn't deviate for that. That would be me, but that's very clear symbolism to me. And he's even got the pillars, which would be the, on each side, which would be the equinoxes. Right on. Yeah. You know, if a kid draws a tree, I'm not going to say the kid uh, was intending to draw a world tree or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, but you can kind of just look at the artwork and there's, you know, hidden layers of information uh, underneath even what the creator was intending. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm with the multiple layers of meaning thing because I think the uh, like I'm on the thread of mythology and our stories of mythology comes from the fact that things are multi-layered and that you can find puns and, uh, you know, more than one meaning in different words or break the phonetics apart in words. Uh, that's why I'm really loving McHugh's book because he's showing how the... <laughs> at least in the Mesopotamian system, that's exactly what they're doing, that the uh, logograms that they would use for words would have like a, a variety of meanings. And that's how you can pull out strange things like, you know, the Taurus constellation being cut off at the shoulder or Samson killing 10,000 men with the jawbone of an ass, stuff that makes no sense. Like, why would you even make that up? You can't even really derive some kind of moral out of it and that it's coming from the fact that the uh, ancient priest class would actually think when they could find new layers of meaning embedded in <laughs> what they're looking at, that they were getting a divine revelation mm -hmm. and that that was to be kept secret. But in, I also agree with what Dylan's saying that in terms of how the church uses the symbolism, uh, they have a rigid system. So there's, can you zoom in on the crown? Cause that looks like at the top, the triple tau. You're talking black, about on those uh, black pegs. Yeah. The the Hierophant Hierophant. Card. Yeah. It's the triple looks like the triple tau, which is going to be encoding the Neros, the 608 Bacchus, mm -hmm. all of it. I that would have Lord. I'm in agreement with that. If but back to the uh, Catulo, <laughs> you know, the, the Sola card here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm still on this thread of Cat Catulus, the, or Catulus, the, uh, Gaius Valerius Catullus, the late Roman Republic poet who wrote mostly homoerotic poetry. So are, like, why would they be naming this card that if we can't really find a lot of other correlation to that word? It's uh, to me, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, the longer we look at it, the more I do see all the similarities, you know, the, that little mechanism, that balancing, whatever, uh, Looks kind of like scales, but not really. Uh, do, it does resemble the triple cross of the Hierophant. We did mention the hat. You know, I'm starting to think about the two. Uh, so the uh, the two bald Hadid, the two bald headed fellas, uh, it, underneath the standard Hierophant. You know, the right away. I'm starting to wonder if that's the split between the Valentinians and the Scythians. You know, the two Gnostic schools, one believes that uh, the Demiurge is evil and the other believes that the Demiurge is benefic beneficent. Uh, that's kind of what I'm starting to think we're, we're seeing with the two uh, acolytes at the foot of the Pope there. 
another thing I'll throw out that, you know, we haven't really gone on this track yet, but I think there's probably something there of how these cards may be talking about constellations. And I think that's probably something there for sure. And if Catulo in Latin means puppy, which it does exactly. Well, where would we find a puppy in the sky would be Canis minor, or maybe uh -huh. you can make a, a case for Canis major. And there's also a uh, puppus or pupus, <laughs> which is part of like the, uh, the Karina thing. So basically my point is that if you have Gemini, which is Mercury, I'll go back one. And he's even wearing the winged cap of Mercury. Well, right at Gemini's feet is Canis, Canis minor. Or if we're talking about um, Canis major, that's also right near Gemini as well, or under Orion's feet could be either thing. Yeah. Yeah. Orion's also Orion also being like a hero figure. If this is some kind of like warrior type archetype, although he doesn't have a beard, so probably not. Two things. Does that red hat on the next slide or the one that we were just on, does that have scales on it? What, what, it looks like like a double tailed, like, I don't know what the hell that is. It looks like a fish scale or something. It does look scaly. But, yep. And then that T that I think one of you already said that th that was the Tau, but also that's a symbol of the boundary line. So even if, whether those are scales or not, if it is scales, it would indicate that end of like a summer boundary when it's like the second half of the year is about to start. But I don't know if there's anything to that. It just. Uh, and there's a strong link nice. between Terminus and Mercury as well. I mean, yeah. it's the same yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, dude. Uh, also, too, right, the scales, Libra, obviously heading into fall, all that stuff. Uh, but there are several other um, cards that show kind of like scaly um, entities or kind of like dragons and stuff like that. So I kind of get like a red dragon-y sort of vibe from that. Mario, do you know what that is in the bottom left? Like, see that like like white triangle? It looks like there's writing in that. Or is that just... That's the V for five. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing with this deck too, right? They they place it all over the place. So there's no like standard placement for the number. The wound on the leg is very bizarre. Would and that be considered the, the thigh? It's on the thigh, right. You Which, know, there's, you know my thing with uh, northern thigh symbolism. The thigh of the bull, the... Pythagoras's uh, golden thigh. I've been reading the more thigh about of the bull thigh being stuff. the thigh constellation in the Dindara zodiac of Egypt in the place of Ursa Major, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, then, but this is also, you know, I think strongly linked to the Pythagorean tradition. And he's said to have a golden thigh and other characters that have, you know, strong Jupiterian, Eupater, Savior. Uh, Demiurgos, cre creator deity, and coding are also going to have something going on with their thigh. And just so the audience knows, Meros in Greek is his thigh. So you see that in the Mount Meru, you know. Yeah, and where did Pythagoras show his golden thigh? The north where the gods assemble. Dude, that's awesome. Can you say that again about Mount Meru? Me Merus? That's, that means thigh? Yeah, I'll spell it for you. Uh, Mu... Uh, Eta, Rho, Omicron, Sigma. So it'd be like M E R O S. Very Indeed. interesting. Nice. It's another name for Ursa Major. Gotcha. Right. Like the thigh from the Dindara Zodiac of Egypt. Yeah. This is the value of having the ebooks of Spirit World. I can just type in <laughs> all these obscure shit. I do the same thing. Makes me look smart. I try to give you a shout out though every once in a while. Too, so I don't too take much, all the uh, it's too much information for one man to remember. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to move us forward. We have so many things to look at. Sesto or Sesto. Big old torch, right? Uh, it makes me wonder Another if. Another the... red rocket. Yeah, dude. Or, you know, part of me, it almost looks like it's supposed to be like a subliminal, like devilish tail or demonic tail or something, maybe. I see you know, it. Either and we way. also have winged feet, but no sandal. 
can we appreciate how that looks like drag queen story hour on the right? What the <laughs> hell is that? <laughs> right, dude, that is, that's a great call. Um, I've never noticed the winged feet there. So uh, the lover's card always gave me creepy vibes realizing that you know, what in uh, Zodiac language is the twins. So it implies like, you know, family. And then when you come in with the uh, tarot, they become lovers. And so you're like, why is it got it? When you stack it up, it has like an incestuous implication, you know, kind of makes your skin crawl at first. But I think uh, it strangely enough may have, uh, you know, it may be preserving pharaonic tradition. You know, certain bloodlines, that's how they keep it in the family. Uh, and that's really creepy, but it does kind of make sense of why the, the lover's card is the twins card in Zodiac language. I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but hear me out. Uh huh. You have Sesto in the top left, which is six. And then right, you have another six. And then the bottom left, you have another six. You literally have six, six, six right there. Oh, bro. Yeah, that's really great. Very interesting. So true. So true. Yeah, yeah. And there aren't any other cards where the six is on or the number is on there twice. Right. That yeah, I know exactly. of. I mean, maybe we'll see more as we go forward, but I didn't catch that anywhere else. But you're right. Here it is in the corner, and here it is there. And Sesto does mean six. That is so interesting. So uh in my Enneagram uh work, uh Artemis and Apollo. The twins are sixes. And uh, through the uh, work with the Star Wars thing, I've totally tied them into this card. The Artemis and Apollo as the twins. And what's the six in the Enneagram? By the way, guys, we're going to do a full-blown <laughs> dive into the Enneagram and all the occult of that on Sunday night, me and Gabriel. So, you know, get ready for that. Yeah, it'll be good. It'll be a good one. Uh, number six is our loyalists with the shadow of fear. And so uh, Apollo is uh, kind of the ascended aspect. And it's uh, as it um, is very mindful, high minded information. You know, uh, I think of uh, Mark Zuckerberg is actually like the uh, quintessential uh Apollonian six personality. He's going to, you know, put you in Twitter timeout for a wrong think uh, or was once upon a time uh, that kind of that kind of personality. So, yeah. And then Artemis is the shadow of that, the fearful one. She guards the wilderness. Uh, so they're both sixes, but he's the ascended public side. She's the private uh, seedy side. Uh, so, yeah. And that uh, torch, I mean, it kind of does like tie into Prometheus. Uh -huh. One of the secrets of like one of the techniques of like uh, the bishops and stuff is the aspirate doesn't really matter. So if you drop that P, you have Roma Dios, which is the strong God. Just anecdotal. God. But no, just no, put no, it on there. that's great, man. Uh, so, so the notice 6, 6, how 6 is also where but, when they thought that the great cycle of all the procession through all 12 signs was 24,000 years. That's when they pegged 666 to the Nero's and they thought 36 Nero's gave you a full processional age. Yeah. Or and that's a barosis for anyone who wants to look that up. So notice how he's admiring that flame too. This is something that you'll uh, notice in tarot is sometimes, especially a lot of the uh, pages or princes, they'll be holding uh, a chalice or a disc or something and they're admiring it you know they're like almost lusting over it which i think is really interesting um some people equate the guy who is marrying uh, the couple this alchemical marriage that's happening with uh, lucifer the light bringer i don't really know uh i do think that's kind of curious though that uh, he's admiring this flame potentially obviously look the freaking sun right behind him right it's kind of curious um also just wanted to say too that uh the lover's card corresponds with gemini which is ruled by mercury and so having the uh winged feet i think is kind of a curious overlap 
as well for sure and then i just have to point out that central mountain right there too between the lovers i think that's beautiful and actually i do have a slide that has a uh, lovers card on it because i think that there is a curious thing that's going on um with some of the lovers cards and one of the cards that's actually not in the major arcana within this deck uh, i believe it's the ace of swords so you'll see a red sword and then you'll see two people around it yeah right this is the weirdest one this one is so weird <laughs> so yeah, this I is know. the ace of swords from the solabushka yes on the left here is, yes correct and this is the marseille marseille tarot marseille yeah, yeah. It's an updated Marseille. Uh, this is the Jodorowsky um, version of the deck. But one of the things that's really fascinating is notice just the hand and arm placement of the Solabuska version, especially that upper arm. Whose arm does that belong to? It's like an impossible arm. And I thought that this links to the lover's card because a lot of times one of the traditions with this card is that it's very ambiguous what's going on. You know, like uh, this is why I picked that example to show you guys. It's like it's very handsy and you don't know who is with who or if they're happy or not happy, if they're unite, if they're uniting or if they're breaking apart. And that is actually one of the symbols that comes along with Gemini symbolism is that a lot of people associate the number two with uniting. But actually, uh, symbolically, there is an opposition going on with the number two. There's a division and conflict that can be interpreted with the number two. Um, so I think that that is one of the reasons why some of these lovers cards, you don't know exactly what's going on. And then here in this ace of swords, you don't know exactly what's going on. Yeah, I think you're right. It looks like, uh, the rebus, the, the alchem, you know, the alchemical, uh, romance, if you will. And, um, that shield, can you zoom in on that? Cause there's a feather in the hat, right? The feather, or I think it's in her hat or in her hand. I don't, I can't really tell. It's yeah, also got symbolism. the shape, like the hood of a King Cobra. In my opinion. Yeah. yeah. But that shield is like a clear, but there's no writing. I was hoping there was going to be writing on that so we could know what that was on that like kind of broken one. But what's that yeah. in the bottom? Looks there's a lot like of a globus. Lob. There's a lot of like globus Krusiger stuff going on on some of the poles and um, yeah. staffs in this deck as well. Yeah. What's what's the MS stand for? And what is that number? Is that a VAV or a number at the bottom left? I think this album. is the one like your okay. eight, like one ace of swords here. But it is bizarre to have, you know, it's almost like a Siamese twins going yeah. on here. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. With a weird third arm growing between their heads. And I'll just and say like too. Super deformed head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and, you know, that's not like it can't be probably accidental because like the, the this is not like low grade amateur art no really everything weird. was meticulously done in my opinion uh -huh. um it's really interesting i read this book on subliminal uh advertising basically and what i learned from this book was that they will sometimes especially older cigarette ads from like the 70s and 80s and stuff i noticed i did a presentation on it years ago um they will elongate people's arms they will have impossible scenes essentially you know where it'll be a few people a group of people and someone is standing behind them but they're like way too tall for it to make sense or their arm is way too long to wrap around everybody or whatever and so they were doing like photoshop stuff to elongate and create these impossible scenes and i don't know exactly the history behind it or what the deal is but i think it captures your attention somehow you know, and it makes you think in a different sort of way or whatever. So this has been going on for hundreds of years for whatever reason. Something kind of like totally like side, like a side note, just because I, 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 I very rarely look at the card on the right. But then when I do, I'm like, oh, you have Cupid, who is also Eros, obviously the sun. And you will see that on the inscriptions that were found at Delphi. You'll see Eros. You'll also see Iota Eta, which is an epithet, an epithet. No epithet for Apollo, so it looked like uh, I H if you looked at it in Greek. It transliterates as I E. It's the root of Jesus and all these other Yah type of gods. It corresponds to the Yud Hey, the first two letters of Yova or Tetragrammaton, etc. Yeah, for president. And then you have the three aspects exactly. Yeah, which kind of looks like the Trinity in code or something. Kind of like that Brahm. Brahma Shiva, uh, sorry, Brahma Vishnu Shiva type of thing we were talking about earlier. 
Yeah. Yeah. And also too, uh, with this being related to Gemini, you have the twin pillars, but whenever you see twin pillars or two entities, there's always a hidden third pillar, you know, that I always think. Oh, is and it, those are those pillars, Mario on the MS. Like, cause that's the only card that has like, it's not a boundary on the card. Right. Mm, interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure. I was mostly referencing uh, the figures on the right. Even where Cupid is pointing, no, there are arrow. boundaries on the cards. There's like a border on them. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah. Never mind. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Um, even Cupid, where he's pointing his arrow, it's almost kind of ambiguous a little bit. It's kind of like he's pointing towards the middle person, but it's, it's kind of not directly spot on or something. So similarity to this too with the the middle sword here is not perfectly dividing the red and blue. It's like we're leaning into one side. We're not actually balanced here. Right. And it's a massive sword, too. And what about those clouds, how they kind of mirror each other? Does that mean anything? Oh, shit, dude. I mean, Three, there's 33 like, or six. Like, you know? There's six, just like, uh, well, I mean, there's six prominent ones, at least. Oh, gotcha. And mm -hmm. the card is six. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no. The card on the left is one. Sorry. Yeah. I'm these are not the other. I mean, I'm, I'm like wicked but... confused. They're interesting. Yeah. yeah. Interesting to put those two together to look at them at the same time there, Mario. Yeah, thanks. It, man. it seems like they're designed to leave you with a sense of uh, not having resolved what you just looked at. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm sorry, true. guys, so. if I didn't catch this. Did you know what MS stands for? No, I don't. Uh, is there mercury is, sulfur? Is, that I was. A, I think that was a guess we had a while back. That's is M part of the guessed. Roman numeral system? Yeah. But I don't so, know which one. Yeah. I'm so confused because I thought the one card 1, in this was Panfilo. In this uh, Venetian deck, I thought the one card was Panfilo, but this also has one? Are you sure? Yeah, that's one? so we're looking at uh, two different sections of the uh, tarot. So there's the major arcana, one or zero through 21. And then there's the minor arcana with four suits. And they have uh, one through 10 plus the court cards. So the Roman numeral M is 1000. And the S is used as a reference to one half, like a fraction. I don't uh, know if that matters here. Well, maybe this is the encode for the added 1,000 years to history. Ah. Uh, <laughs> also, just noticing, you know, the figure on the right, blue, figure on the left, red, figure on the left, uh, head is exposed, hair is exposed, figure on the right, they're wearing a helmet. Um so they're definitely playing with this uh, kind of polarity duality thing. I mean, yeah, I know that, this would the be... colors match on them. The lovers from the Marseille too. They're blue on the right, but it's uh, our right to them. It would be the blue is on the left from their facing. I don't know what this would correspond to in Latin, but it it's almost like the masculine, and then it's almost like uh, material and spirit, but they're reverse but it wouldn't be reversed if it was spiritus breath maybe that's like a feminine i don't i just wish you guys knew what the ms stood for or like do you know what that card's called it would be the ace of swords oh, okay yeah i yeah. was look oh, oh ace of swords oh hang on because i got like a key on my phone that um that i was looking at but maybe they don't have it here well there's definitely a it is very bizarre to get that masculine, feminine, red lodge, blue lodge type of thing going on for the Ace of Swords. You know, a card that traditionally is about like new ideas, right? Like okay. sudden inspiration, but also it's like the classic um, Ace of Spades. There's a reading of the Ace of Swords that is like, you know, portent of imminent danger or, or death. Yeah, uh, the way I look at it, you know, sword symbolism is really interesting because swords uh, break things down. You know, it puts holes in things and it severs things. So there is a division uh, symbolically that comes with the sword itself versus, say, the cups. You know, it's more unifying and holistic and brings uh, things together. The sword divides. Hmm. I even relate it to division, actually. Yeah, I definitely, yeah, for sure is related to that. Uh, let's, uh, I'm going to move us on to yeah, looking man. at some further cards.
Swords are also a symbol of temporal power. Sure. Mm -hmm. So like you'd have like the temporal power, which would be the sword, and then like the more spiritual affairs ruled by the book. So just just something yeah. to keep in mind. Uh, which I, is really go for it, dude. Well, my last thought on that on that one is uh bloodletting. I'm wondering about bloodletting also as a you know a, a very primitive form of healing. But you know, he's got his arm kind of, you know, hold your arm like this and we'll uh, you know, isolate that the blood and the swelling. Just a thought. Yeah, and I was just going to say regarding the swords, and you mentioned the book, um, it's funny that swords or sword has literally a word right there. And so there's a lot of really fun uh, symbolism that relates the sword to right communication, error. So I think writing and all that kind of stuff too. Uh, the feather of Ma'at, you know, um, the air symbolism. Hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that exactly. six, that six theme. It, I mean, the the whether it's like I don't, I, we don't know the exact specifics, right? Because we don't know what the M and the S stands for. But it really is like, if you want to call it Solomon's seal, the cube, the hexagram, the six, the 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 blade and the chalice, the you know the masculine, feminine, the material and spiritual blending. It's all there, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This one's very interesting. We might be on this one for a minute. Dio Taro. Like, why are they calling this God Tor? <laughs> the God Tor? Right. Yeah, I know. This one Lord was confusing God. me a little bit, you know, uh, because to me, Taro, obviously, uh, I think of Taurus, the bull, you know, things like that. But with uh, the cherry card, I think more of a Cancerian sort of thing, clearly. Um, so, yeah, this one's a little bit of a mystery to me. And then uh, the return of those scales, Dylan, uh, all over this chariot here, right? Yeah, and uh, Tauros uh, in Greek, Latin, uh, French, Toro, Tiro, Tyrant, Turret, Tower. They all share that same radical symbolism, which pertains to height actually and um so it's usually like things that are higher that you know because like rank and stuff where you are power in life it's it's based on height at the deep core of like the ideas laid up in words yeah and then the alternate word for toro would be bull or bull sorry <laughs> slip there bull and bull bull being a word that refers to like a secret council like a hidden rulership type of idea. Right, right. And then I do love the fact that there is still a chariot, you know, going yes. on here symbolically. And so... Um, well, at least a I, chair. It does seem like it has wheels, though. It does. It doesn't look like a very nice chariot or like a formidable one. <laughs> but uh, to me, you know, it's just fascinating that they still encode the chariot. When I look at any travel symbol whether it be boat, horse, chariot, I've said this many times before, uh, I think of the psychopomp. I think of the journey of souls. I think of the journey to the other side. And so I think that's appropriate with uh, the Solobuska version. And then obviously I think that's appropriate with the uh, classic Rider Waite version. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, What's... I'm thinking about uh, Ariga, the charioteer. Oh, yeah, I bet. Yeah. Who, who is, you know, uh, a little god in the, in the sign of Taurus. Uh, who is actually much closer to cancer than I thought when I looked at the star map, you know, it's pretty much right off of his heel is uh, Gemini and then cancer. They're all bundled in close enough. Uh, but yeah, uh, Auriga, the charioteer never, never fails to pop in the little God in Toro. Is that supposed to be representative of Caesar or something? Like, what is with the pronounced nose? It does look that? like it's supposed to be someone specific. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's a few instances where you can just tell that they were referencing a real life person. So that would not surprise me at all. Or a uh, ancient historical person who's maybe more mythology than history, but we're presented sure. with as history. Yep, a construct. Yep. And then that's the thing is like Caesar appears to have existed, the JC, but he also fulfills a lot of the qualities for the Neros and for other aspects of astro theology. But there's like writings attributed to him. But we also know that the history of 
like the main industry of Rome, it was forgery in a lot of ways. So it's hard to say what is and isn't real based on texts and writings. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, one of the more important things about the rider weight version of the chariot card and most chariot uh, cards in general is this spin, this movement of the heavens, you know, around mm -hmm. the pole star. And so you get that with the chariot wheel itself. It's the churning of heaven. You get that literally with that red top on the shield in front of the chariot. And then you also um, get it symbolically, at least with the star on top of the head of the charioteer, which I equate to the North star and the heavens are rotating around it, which literally you can see the firmament <laughs> above his head. Um, and then here with the Solobuska version, you have that big wheel, right? And then you have the two smaller wheels. So again, implying this movement. Another thing I've never really thought of before with the word Taro, but first of all, like, if it wasn't clear to people the connection between Tau and Tav, just look. I mean, it's the same, different names for the same letter. Look up here. The Latinized U looks like a V to us. So there's that. And uh, that's also why philologically U's and V's switch out between languages and dialects quite frequently. But if we're looking at the Tau or the Tav as being a type of cross, right? The other cross symbol, which is of course like a solar ecliptic symbol and a Mithraic symbol and a Christian symbol, a, a solar deity symbol. Um, you know, they they put the cross on your head on Ash Wednesday still, but in other versions of the cult, it would be a tav that they would put on your forehead, which in my opinion is the actual mark of the beast. But so we know that one of the name, like one of the mo like monograms for Christ was the key row or the chi row, the X and the Greek letter row, which looks like a P. Also but Osiris. What's that? Also Osiris. So uh, I want you to elaborate on that for me, but Tau or Tav row could be like an alternate key row or chi row because the X turned sideways becomes a T or a Tav. Uh, it's, it's like similar in symbolism and meaning. I mean, X is also 10, but 10 starts with a T in our language. So maybe when they're saying Dio Taro, they're saying God, Lord Christ, you know. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Christ. With the set, I mean, it's number seven too. Being right, the, the good shepherd. Uh, I think he's basically a psychopomp character. He's, he's a, you know, the shepherd of souls, you know, um, I do have a slide that could be appropriate to look at if you don't mind pulling it up uh, just before. Actually, it doesn't matter. Just go to the slide because I have the chariot card there as well. But if you'll notice in the chariot card uh, in the Rider weight version, he's like fused into the chariot itself. It's a cubic stone, you know, and there's no implied movement from what I gather with it but the fact that he's fused within the stone is very very curious and um in the slide that chance is going to pull up there's another card later in the major arcana where they're like cut at the waist it's actually i believe the final card in the major arcana yeah um, this would be the equivalent of like the world or universe in the traditional tarot right right yeah exactly and the name of this card is wild and yeah. all of everything about this card is wild i'll just say for sure for sure. We have a lot to talk about there. And because you brought up the cross, you know, that's a big part of that card as well. Um, so were you going to pull that up or? or we I could, thought we... I did, but it's only on my screen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all good. <laughs> sorry, man. No, no worries. No worries. Can I just give something to add on to what Chance was saying? Go for it, dude. The Cairo and all that stuff. So that CH, that X or that T interchange, if you will. And the R is it's the stem of Christos, but it's also in the Egyptian word Keru, which is the voice or the word. So which is the logos, hence the Christ being the logos or the word. And um, yeah, it's also known as like the cross of Osiris. So all that stuff mm. is intimately linked. Yeah, and nice. we're going to bump over to Mario's slide, but I just want to throw out there. We didn't even talk about whatever the hell he's holding here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can definitely come back. You know, um, 
And so I just thought it was really curious, you know, uh, the chariot card, the, um, the pillars, the posts around him, you know, probably the four fixed signs or the four cardinal directions, something along those lines, you know, um, and then you have this cross very much symbolic of, um, of the number four. Um, but then also to this, what's going on at the waist, it just reminded me of the chariot card. You know, it's very curious. It's just, it's almost like this figure is severed in half, uh, for whatever reason. And so I thought that that was interesting. And then also just the firmament symbolism, right? So therefore, too, I just look at this as like a firmament symbol uh, behind this figure's head. And then you got this flying dragon. So I kind of equate it with like, there's a lot of different threads um, basically corresponding the great mother symbolically with like a dragon, a chaos dragon. Sometimes uh, if people want to search up the uh, Typhonian tradition, it's heavy within the Typhonian tradition. The Nag is, Hammadi. Yeah. Serpent mothers of wisdom. Serpent mother. That's what it looks like to me. Serpent mother, uh, which would be kind of at the northern part of the firmament, in my opinion, because that's where, in my opinion, when you see the cross and even when you see the quartered circle, the circle with a cross in it, I look at that as a geocentric symbol. I know people see that as a heliocentric solar symbol, uh, but I think it's an earth-based symbol. And so I look at that center point within the cross as uh, the northern sky. I got one that I've been holding on to for Gabe for a while. According what? to Robert Beek, his Greek etymological dictionary, the word Medusa etymologically means ruling or ruler. So that correlates the idea of a serpent, go serpent goddess, if you will, uh -huh. with Arche. The top or the head or the ruler and also with the uh, wisdom medusa that's a, that's a huge trip so uh you know peter mark adams he says that this do this uh, particular deck has a heavy correspondence on the eye of medusa the algol star a uh, serpent's algol uh, right so that so she would be a ruling archon of this deck in fact he might say Right, right, right. Yeah, we'll get into that card. Damn. There's one card specifically that he mentions that he thinks represents the the eye, Algol. That's I, a trip and a half. That's 13th. cool. You know, you know what he's talking about. Yeah, the thirteenth uh, card. Uh, so, chance I'm thinking about with this de this particular card, I'm thinking about that new uh, uh, Star Force that they made uh, uh, with the latest emblem on their. Uh, it's a Space. looks like a looks like a skull a uh, Space elephant farce. is that what you're talking about Space farce yeah the new Space farce it actually has a lot of ingredients that correspond with this card including the hajib this red hair this red wig that's on the ground or a, it looks like an Egyptian uh, headdress that is oh. in the Space farce logo right now you're talking about this there that's it space delta 18 official emblem there's so many corresponding ingredients right there yeah wow. nobody nobody yeah. paid nobody uh pay any heed to the fact that the first director of nasa came from hollywood you know nothing to see here <laughs> yeah right yeah exactly is that is that latin for like nebuchadnezzar i can't read it yeah, yeah the word is hard to make out but let me go to it in my slides because i typed it out so you can also, see. you notice how that person is holding the hat. Remember that one of the early cards where the guy was like walking away with the shield and he had that hat, that red hat with the crown? Yep, that yeah. hat is back. So if you were to lay these cards out, does it tell a story or is they just... I feel like it question. has to. Well, I, I need to make a slide good. like that where they're all just put in a row. Uh, one thing I just want to point out too is the wand. It's almost like she's conducting an orchestra or something. It reminds me of two things. Something's being played. Either this is the universe, as in like uh, like a song, right? Um, nice. Or or uh, you know potentially like the Akashic record. This is a record being played. Whatever. I, I get the sense that something is being played because also it reminds me. I've never played it. I've only seen it like in cartoons probably. But uh, isn't there a game where you have like a loop uh, and you're kind of like um, scuttling it along with the stick 
And so you have this loop and then the stick is kind of like uh, you're trying to like spin it around and you're just kind of like running around as a kid with this stick. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Does that does that make sense? It's almost like a hula hoop sort of thing. I'll find an image. I, I think it, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It almost looks like she's doing that with the firmament. And then there's the, you know, just to back up what I was saying about the X or the Tav <laughs> right there in the middle of this uh, solar daemon of the drag winged dragon. Yeah, this Nabu Kod and Asor. <laughs> Nabu Kod and Asor. Yeah, I don't know exactly how you might pronounce that, but you've got Kod right in the middle of it. Interesting. And you have Asor at the end. There's a lot there. Odin is in the word <laughs> in the middle of it. Nice catch right there in the middle. It's called hoop rolling <laughs> for anyone who wants to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He found it. So uh, one thing we've, we've seen a lot of the, uh, the Phoenician purple, haven't we? Wouldn't, wouldn't you say Dylan? Like there's been purple on almost all every card. Pretty much. Yeah. Right. The first thing is probably because it's created the by Venetians. the chariot. Yeah, yeah. And then and you know, I just learned that the uh the Mirex shell that makes the Phoenician purple, it also creates the the blue, the Tyrrhenian blue as well, with the same with the same cre cre uh same animal, which is actually sourced in uh northeast Florida is like one of the main hubs for that particular uh dye for the Phoenician purples and blues. Now that is a thread worth pulling on because are there other places in the world to grab that Murex? And is it way easier in Florida? I mean, we have uh, Dylan's putting forth all kinds of work suggesting that the, whoever the Phoenicians were or whoever they're encoding were yeah. probably visiting the Americas. Yeah, I, I, I think about that often, about the history of the Murex uh, industry. Uh, because that's right off the coast of uh, Jekyll Island. You know, we're just up the, up the coastline from Jekyll Island with uh, northeast Florida. That color is also a color for martyrs. So you'll see like martyrs sometimes clothed in it with uh, in, like art. That's cool. Martyr, Martyrinian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and but, also Murex is horrible, deadly poison as a byproduct. Don't forget that. Do you see what like stars like are how many stars like because it almost looks like uh, like if you were to look at that like the equator it's like in the north there's stars but in the south it's just blue unless it's like faded or something I can't see. No, stars I think in that's place. encoding that under the uh, you know the stars that are dead are under the earth you know the ones that you don't see and the ones Underworld. that you do see yeah the horizon. I mean that's my guess. I, obviously, I have no idea, but <laughs> that's what I would put on it. It's so interesting how the, the ribbon in the world card, the red crossed ribbon is at the bottom, just like in the Solibuska deck. It's got this loose red morphic shape at the, underneath her. You know, the uniformity of it is really fascinating. And I've never yeah. noticed that in the world card, but you have an X and an X right there. Right, right. Yeah, good exactly. fellow, goodbye. And it's also 21. The card 21, so XX1, if the figure in the middle is a one. I don't know. Yeah. Just throwing it out there. And also, uh, just be a... go ahead, dude. I was just going to say, notice how, at least in the Rider weight deck, they don't put the Zodiac signs out of order. Like you'll see in the church, they often mix up the lion and the bull to conform to the way it's written oh, in the okay. Bible. Right, yes. I just nice. noticed yeah, this triple cross right here, too, representing the ecliptic in the tropics, most likely. Uh, do you know, um, that's the signature of the artist. I'm not sure if you're aware. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. But it doesn't mean that she's not encoding that, but it is for Pamela Coleman Smith. Who, cool, uh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, you know, you know your lore. I love that. That's some good yeah. lore. Very cool card, man. So, guys, we're at the two-hour mark. I've got plenty of steam left if you guys want to keep going. But, you know, once somebody wants to tap out, we can they can leave whenever, and we can work our way towards a, a finish-up. But, I mean, I, I'd be down to go for another 
30 to 60 minutes on this. I'm fascinated. I mean, we're about to hit card number eight, which is by far maybe the most interesting so far. Um, so what do you guys think? I'm good to go. I'm good to go. All yeah. right. Brace yourselves, guys. What are we looking at here? Oh, I should see it. Is yeah, this yeah. the shell of the Murex down here in the corner? Scaramouche, Scaramouche, while we do the Fandango. And so who wants to take black. a rip on the uh, symbolism of holding a baby over the fire? Because that's a uh, there's a lot to that. So you guys are probably in agreement. I think this is a direct correspondence. This is one of the ones where it looks more obvious to me, at least. And I think one of the uh, details, though, that I that could be overlooked is the fact that I think they're trying to give this figure a lion's mane, actually, because the strength card corresponds with Leo. So she has this wild hair. It kind of reminds me of fire, but it also reminds mm -hmm. me of the lion's mane. You know, and then also when I look at the strength card uh, personally, I see a story between Virgo and Leo. So I see the Virgin um, and then I see Leo, which are right next to each other. That's so, exactly what it is. The right? sun transitioning from uh, Leo to uh, Virgo. You even see with eighth. Eighth is August. That's um, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But why does that guy? I, you know what? Now, now that I see this, I have seen this deck before. Is yeah. that is that more Kronos Saturn symbolism? What the yeah. hell is he doing with the baby? Yeah, it looks you got like it. looks like some of the other ones that I've seen with that. And well, is that like a threshing? Like a, of, is that? There's babies being held over fires to make them divine in mythology as well. Fire, they are uh, being baptism of fire. Blackened. I heard the they did that in ancient Britain, like with the druids and stuff. They did all kind. They would toss the baby over fires like a baptism. It wouldn't ever burn or whatever, but it was like symbolic. Man, that is powerful. And so uh, also what's standing out to me is we go from the fire pit in the old Solabuska gets replaced by a mountain on the skyline. And it's a particularly steep mountain that looks like a volcanic structure. You know, that's a, a very acute angled mountain. I think we could say that there is a handoff from the uh, sacrificial fires in the Solabuska to maybe an implication of the volcanic fires in the uh, Rider weight. Guys, Which is, is this the same woman? Is this the same woman that was had the cut on the leg or whatever that was crouching? Remember, she had like the shield and she's like crouching and she one... did have a red leg and a shield. Yeah. So that is that like more Virgo? Kind of does look the same. And what number was that? We were on five. There, right there. For that. Could be. She's not got a. Does she have a laurel still? So anyway, in terms of the the mythology of baby and fire, I know that that's something related to Demeter. That she was a wet nurse for. I can't remember the name, but it was a queen of Eleusis or Ele Eleusis, <laughs> however you want to say it. <laughs> Helios, <laughs> and she would feed the baby the food of the gods or the nectar of the gods, the ambrosia, and hold it over a fire to like make it divine. And that was to strip him of his mortal flesh. And so that didn't that didn't work out though. I think that um, she was like caught doing it, and the baby she accidentally like dropped the baby in the fire, and the baby got fully burned up. Right. I don't have really much of an explanation for why Demeter was doing that that I am aware of. So there's probably, you know, uh, probably something we could find out if we really got into the Lumashi or the constellation writing to figure out why that would be happening. So I'm going to just take a look at my planisphere while you guys carry on. <laughs> well, Proclus wrote um, that the moon, or which is like the mother goddess Isis or Demeter, symbolizes Selene is the cause of nature to mortals and the self-revealing image of the fountain of nature. Nice. Um, you know, it's pretty obvious, but just the direct correlation between the lion uh, and Leo uh, being ruled by the sun. He is symbolic of the sun. She is dealing with her son, her child. And then in the Solabuska, it's the sun once again. You know, and then also one of the things with the strength card is there's like a debate. It's like a classic debate. Is she 
uh, pulling the jaws of the lion open or is she shutting them? You know, and I just think it's really fascinating that even their uh, their hands are in a similar position, you know, except obviously it's not the jaws of a lion, but it's the legs of her son, presumably. And then also just to give Peter Mark Adams some credit for some of the research he's done. This is just like a quick blurb about this card. Um, so historical references, Gaius Claudius Nero was a commander in the second Punic war. It could also be construed as an opaque reference to the Nero, the first Roman emperor to be initiated into Mithraism in connection with which the first century author Pliny Nero's contemporary suggests that the emperor practiced human sacrifice, you know, so for what it's worth. And he expands on all this stuff in the larger book. And I think Nero is a very obvious candidate to be encoding the Nero's cycle. I mean, even that story of him fiddling as Rome burns, that could be like the end of a previous Nero cycle and the commencement of another one. Like, I'll get back to you guys. <laughs> it might take me a while, but I'm looking into that. But in terms of, you know, this is a very simple glance at the planisphere for the region around Virgo and Leo. You have uh como coma barenses which is depicted as hair and you know she's got some pretty wild hair up there but i learned from McHugh, john McHugh, that the uh, mesopotamians had a goddess of pregnancy that was near virgo the virgin that the stars of coma barenses were uh making up this pregnancy goddess i can't remember her name off the top of my head it's a weird name but as you can see also the baby is being held by the thighs and right above nice right above coma barenses is ursa major which is also the thigh so that and then next to virgo between virgo and leo kind of below them you have corvus which is the crow but also the blackening you know symbolically in alchemy yeah. negredo which is what you're doing when you char the flesh you're blackening it so all of those things, just from a little glance at the planisphere, could be in play for why this symbolism is at this point of the deck. Right, right. Also just noticing that they're intentionally trying to cover up her left half, um, you know, with the shield, and then even um, the rod that she has is coming from that section. And then, I don't know, she's just kind of cut off. So I think that's very much deliberately done. Does the angle of that instrument or whatever that is, uh, does that matter? Is that like what they believe to be like the tilt of the earth, so to speak? I would not be surprised if it mattered <laughs> for sure. Yeah. What doesn't matter with this? Um, also the word Neron being related to Nero is According to like, you know, we keep idea Wikipedia, a word that is referring to someone who's like cruel or a tyrant, a Neron. And obviously, you know, if you didn't understand what was being symbolically encoded here, it seems like an obvious act of cruelty. As does the point where, you know, we pass Leo and start to go it further into the declination of the sun. You know, that's when the sun becomes more cruel. Uh, it's like, depending on where you are, it's actually hotter for a little while there. You know, August can be brutal. September right. can be really hot, too. And the passing point from uh, from August into uh, September, that's the X of, on the Analima. We're crossing over that uh, that pressure point in the, the tall. This Analima? Big, the big eight in the sky. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Eight, yeah. And if you drop the aspirate, it, Neros is just Eros, which is Cupid. Right on. Yep, yep. On a which more is a, also in Greek would be Eta Rho Sigma HRS mm. Horus. Nice. You were muted there. Oh, it might have been uh, Eta Rho. I can't remember if it's Omega Sigma or Omicron Sigma. I think it's Omega Sigma. Well, if it's O's, Omega would be the letter, right? It just depends. There's the Omega and then there's also the Omicron. So um, the traditional... I mean, like phonetically, the sound O instead of uh is usually Omega. But, you know, just 
potato potato type of joke. The, uh, <laughs> traditional meaning of the strength card. Uh, a lot of times, this woman actually is corresponded with the whore of Babylon, and um, depending on the deck you check out, there are some occult decks where it's literally the whore of Babylon riding a beast, a seven-headed beast. Um, it's like a lion uh, beast thing. And so I just think it's interesting that like on a psychological level, um, part of this card is literally um, taming your inner beast, you know? So some cards, uh, instead of calling it strength, it's called lust. And so the line is looked at as a beast of her own creation. You know, she's the Virgo. So she gave a virgin birth to the beast, her counterpart, you know, potentially the first male, depending on your cosmology or whatever. So that child is symbolically a little beast as well, you know, which I think is kind of interesting. And then also getting into deeper tarot stuff. But this is one of the classic switches, you know, with later decks that sometimes the, the strength card is number 11 and not number eight. And sometimes, you know, um, balance or adjustment. Um, is either number 11 or number eight they flip-flop right what you just said correlates to with the nag hamadi pistis sophia giving birth to the demiurge the beast exactly yeah which yeah. is often of... correlated with that lion of the strength card you got it. um this is a good share from pk again doing research on the fly uh we kind of missed the boat on this i'm sure we were all probably aware of it in the back of our head but this spiral shape relating us back to Zeus, Amon, and all the other Amonian symbolism of the the curly hair or the ram's horn being worn. And that shows up on this card down here, but also that is very reminiscent of a shell. So Yeah, why the scales though? It looks aquatic. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Oh, dude, yeah, I'm so aquatic. glad he brought this up. Yeah, yeah. I almost pointed this out earlier. This is awesome. They'll go back to the Saturn image, if you don't mind, if you have it handy. Um, it's really Saturn interesting. Image. You didn't mean this, right? Saturn Kronos, Amon, right? Okay, right here. Good. Cool. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, I mean, so you can obviously Saturn um, is known for eating his children, all that sort of stuff. But um, Capricorn is ruled by Saturn. And one of the things you'll notice with Capricorn illustrations is that the tail of the sea goat always has a curl in it. I, I don't think I've ever seen it where it doesn't have a curl in it. And then the dragon flying in the firmament also had, I think, two or three curls in its tail, right? And it's really fascinating that uh, some versions of Capricorn, it's not a sea goat, but it, well, it kind of is symbolically, but instead of having a fish second half, it actually is inside of a shell. And the shell is always curled. It always has the uh, spiral shell sort of thing. Oh, that's interesting. Chance, can you pull up the Welsh flag? Because I think the Welsh flag is a good uh, reveal to all these all all the symbols we nice. just stacked right there. Cool, cool. I'm into it. Good stuff, PK. It's got the same color red. It's even got uh, the the curl curly Q. Yep. Nice. So uh, you guys have uh, kind of breezed over this one time a while back on the Interverse. You know, uh, you guys were just uh, spitballing. And Chance, I think you said that you can take the word Welsh and with just all the basics of philology, you can get the word Merks. And uh, I think that's quite revealing. Uh, I think this is the... Um, uh, yeah, just to roll that out, uh, W and M switch, L yep. and R switch, SH yep. could be CH or K or yep. X. Yep. Mercs, Welsh Mercs. Yep. It's a sneaky one, but it's there. Yes. Uh, so one thing I've learned in heraldry, and this is, a, this is vague, but I do believe that when you have the white, the red, and the green, you are seeing uh, the imprinting of Mithraic orders. And Mithraic underground orders have been known to leave an impression on the flag of the nations that they've uh, altered their history. And the signature of that effect is the green, white, and the red. And so uh, I just thought I'd throw that in the mix because we are looking at this deck that is so Mithraic. And here is one of my favorite examples of a clearly Mithraic uh, country flag. 
Don't Italians use green, white, and red? I think so, bro. I think so. <laughs> oh, by the way, I checked it, it, in uh, at the at the Delphi at Delphi. The inscription was Eta Rho Omega Sigma for Eros. Totally irrelevant, but I, I nice. Don't <laughs> You're being thorough. <laughs> Dude, it me alive. I hate being like, I hate when I put out incomplete or wrong information on accident. And I tend to do that on live streams and stuff more than like presentations. Oh, yeah. You know? Dude, oh, this is sure, what I've been sure, waiting exactly. for. Dylan, like, I'll wake up in the middle of the, the night on the fly research, live on the fly research. It's super fun. You're going to get addicted to it. <laughs> this is where it's at, this type of collaboration. So. Gabe, just real quick, is that um that's your personal research and takeaway? The uh red, green, and white, or is that something that you came across and is part of the tradition, I guess? Uh that's something I could pull the receipts on. It'll take me a while. Uh I forget the fellow's name. He's really uh uh quite savvy on the Mithraic uh fellowships and how they relate to the Zoroastrian uh brotherhoods and the fact that they are diametrically oppositional in a certain light and so uh but yeah the green white and red flags uh he's proven it out quite a few times and it has a lot to do with uh islam also you know uh the uh the, the history of the islamic brotherhoods uh and how they weave together with the zoroastrian and the uh mithraic got it yeah i think that's an interesting thread yeah i'll dig him up i'll put him in the telegram tonight cool Good point, Brayden. Red, green, and white for Iran and Bul, Bulgaria and Mexico. Very interesting link there. So, Falco, what are we thinking? Whoa. Uh, so, we've gone from August into Virgo. We've crossed over uh, the Vulcanalia holiday officially. Got to point that out. The Vulc Vulcanalia. So I actually think um, first thoughts are that there's a card that I feel like better corresponds with the Hermit. Uh, we should stay on Falco. But the figure is, I think he's looking in the same direction. And he actually has one hand on his beard. He's like clenching his beard, which uh, we've talked about before. Could be a uh, masturbatory sort of symbol or a... Um, uh, fertility symbol, <laughs> pretty much. Obviously, the hermit has a beard. This guy, Falco, has a beard as well. But he's also, I believe he's holding a uh, candle or a torch in his hand, which to me is symbolic of uh, the lantern that the hermit is holding. So I think there's another card that kind of better corresponds with it. But um, Falco, though, is kind of interesting, too, obviously. Yeah, you have kind of the inversion in a lot of ways of the hermit to Falco in terms of the modern hermit looking up, looking down on his knees, standing up, you know, true. And yeah. so back to that knee pad we saw earlier. Now we actually see a character on their knees. Yeah. He's, what kind, that's of, worth. he's kind of in a torture ready position. Don't you kind of think like tie his ankles, put a, a bar between his elbows. It's a pretty torturous little mounted position. He's in. He he looks submissive, right? Yeah, to, to the yeah. heavens or or to some luminary or the sun or whatever. You know, almost makes you think that some of this could be designed to uh, trigger p people who have been tortured in the past. You know, uh, theoretically, like if we're talking about you know some prime primordial MK Ultra programming, this kind of thing might trigger somebody who's been through that kind of torture if they see just the card. You know. Interesting. You know, it makes me wonder too, if we have, I mean, have shields only been used just for defense purposes or has there ever been technology that is shield like that can be used for something else? Because he really wants that shield uh, to be, you know, facing where he's looking, potentially um, getting the rays of the sun or something. That's such a good question. I think that uh, Athena specifically, uh, she is uh, the a goddess of defensive battle strategically that's her her forte uh athena specifically got it interesting um you know what comes to mind too is the number nine i always think of it with the hermit card but the nine has all of these amazing properties to it you know you multiply nine by any number 
reduce the digits always adds up to nine. You half nine, you know, 4.5, that adds up to nine. Half of that adds up to nine as well. Um, so there's this generative sort of thing. Uh, I know there's people in the Telegram that look into uh, Marco Rodin's uh, vortex-based math. Nine is like the queen number. So there's like this Genesis seed sort of component with the number nine that I think is really fascinating. And in some esoteric decks, they will literally show like a sperm cell, like a homunculus sperm cell with the little guy in the head of the sperm, right? And so to me, I almost, I still kind of get that vibe where it's like, if he's honoring the sun and he's looking at the sun, it's almost like he's he's uh, looking back to himself in a way symbolically, you know, as a man, you know, and looking at this projective uh, sort of energy or whatever he's almost kind of like there's this mirroring sort of quality that's potentially going on here yeah about- man yeah it's like maybe he's trying to flash the sunlight back at the sunlight from itself <laughs> yeah yeah i like so that not, nine is also you know anton Lavey in the satanic rituals you know be like, he, he wrote like despite certain uh others attempts to identify a certain number with satan it will be known that nine is his number basically for what mario said because it's the num- number of the ego no matter what you uh, multiply it for, but he's on his knees. If that is, you know, uh, Saturn or Satan, whatever corresponding to that winter portion of the year, well, Capricorn corresponds to the knees and the five points on the crown may correspond to the five months of suffering or the five winter months. Nice. Anecdotal, but we're missing the boat on something. And it's these friggin' like aquatic, hats or whatever the hell they are that's always at the bottom and i got i want to know what that is but uh, nobody's really talking about it and I, i'm looking online i can't find it it's like everyone's just kind of like missed that well like what- I, in terms of it being aquatic feeling i'm just thinking of the venetian phoenician connection yeah. like that somebody oh knew the about seashells that. that's what they made the friggin' die out of that's what the syrian right. purple is made out of okay yeah, I mean, not that that's the only meaning potentially, but we're definitely looking at, I think, uh, whoever commissioned this had some kind of knowledge of maybe <laughs> what has been covered up by the church and the pious fraud. You know, the, the Venetian r- ruling and powerful families were pretty oppositional to the Vatican at this time in history, if I'm not mistaken. You know, and they were the merchants of Venice. Is right and merchants. they were too powerful for the vatican to do anything about it either right yeah it's almost like are they a holdout or a remnant of whatever system the vatican co-opted and you know it's appropriate that we're on the uh the hermit card for this this strange little nugget but i've been considering Karl marx as maybe symbolize uh signifying his own relationship to this priest class because uh, he admits that he want he wants to mimic the look of uh, Moses. That's why he kept his hair long and his beard so you know uh, so domineering. He uh, and so what I think is fascinating. He does come from a, uh, a Jewish family of uh, you know merchants in their own right. Wouldn't it be fascinating if his name it marks? Is actually a uh, hail to the murex, as uh, as though to identify that his family is involved in the very labor-intensive process of the die, the keepers of that die, uh, and it just blows my mind that it's uh, most prominently in Florida. That's just blowing my mind. I can't wait to find out where else. You know, be cool I was to think about how die, die, and die, like all the different meanings of just that word we could be talking about a deity we could be talking about a day we could be talking about coloring we could be talking about death all all rolled up into one or that's mind-blowing yeah yeah now and then falco too being born of a virgin if you will that this card could be in virgo that also makes me think of the falcon-headed horus who is born of the goddess which is allegedly a symbol for the soul one thing that's I also say allegedly because a lot of this shit comes from Jesuit people like Champollion, and I now don't trust anybody's interpretation of hieroglyphics or any of that shit because I don't think the Rosetta stones are legit. That's me. So Jen just sent me 
a picture of what's going on in the night sky right now. And it's interesting we're having this conversation because we basically have the moon in its first quarter phase in an alignment stacked up with Neptune and Jupiter in in the sidereal sign of Aquarius. So, you know, Ju- Jupiter is definitely, you know, the fact that this is also like murky and we're not, even the word murky, Murex, Murks, <laughs> wow. You know, the fact that this is also like mysterious and we're not really sure what we're looking at. It's so Neptunian, it's in, so a, Neptunian. in a lot of ways, yeah, but that we're, we're trying to blow it up Jupiterian style, like they're very fascinating. <laughs> I think we can I'm I'm down to move forward from this one though. I mean, the staff is holding the globus on top is very interesting. Also the way that this is tied probably has something important going on. But it's hard to say. I mean, we is this an analemma? Is this two balls and a cane? What are we looking at? Almost right. looks like a syphilis a syphilis virus. <laughs> I originally thought it was a beta on the right side. Like it kind of <laughs> looks like a B, but I don't think I think I'm seeing things. I just love that he looks like he's in awe, you know, of something, uh, which I think is just really striking and intriguing. But yeah, I'd be happy to move forward for sure. Yeah, that that is a very expressive face depicted there. Like that's what I mean when I say this is not amateur art you know whoever this was commissioned to they were a master of their time yeah yeah absolutely venturio wow it looks like the mercury character only without but it doesn't have it on his head now it's on his feet again right and x tau all that stuff you know, or uh, Teth. Like, and look, there's two X's on this. Oh yeah, good call. It's one of one of the they doubled up the number again, kind of like on the six card. Yeah. Hmm. Right, and there's whenever they show the tetramorphs or four faces of God, the fixed signs in the corners. You know, obviously that makes an implied X. Right. So the fixed cross. Uh, personally, I, I'm noticing uh, the staff just being it's extending from top to bottom the whole entire way through. Um, and the way I symbolically decode that is, you know, this axis moony thing. And so it is the point at which everything turns. And so you're dealing with this wheel symbolism, obviously, in the Wheel of Fortune. So it would be the point of pivot, uh, the axle, if you will, maybe. Yeah. Rhoda, Toro. Venturio, I guess, means I will come in Latin. So it's kind of like that good shepherd returning type of thing. Another nice possible encode here, the fact that there's two X's and X is 10. In Venti is like the word for 20, but it's more literally two tens or two decades. Right. Venti. And there's two X's. And then Rio, Rio being like... You know, is it is it just for convenience that we're splitting the Ventu and Rio? Or are we meant to look at Rio as the Greek word Rio for river? Right, right. 20 rivers. And also uh, Venti has another meaning, wind. So that now you're talking about eloquence, breath, spiritus, words, logos. Nice, nice. And like on this Wheel of Fortune... There are two X's to make this like eight spoked Dharma wheel. Mm-hmm. XX, Venti. Rota or Torah. Right. Yeah. That's one of the traditions with this card. Um, you can start at any letter and just uh, there's a sentence that can be made if you just go all the way around. So I don't, I can't remember where it starts, but it's like Rota, Tarot. Or it's rota, otar, taro, orot. That's or too, right? Uh, is there an S there? Oh no, I'm thinking I'm, of something else. Yeah, it's something I don't. I can't remember what. It, it's something about the great wheel. Um, the wheel. And it's of the life. name of God, the Yud Hey Vav Hey. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So, homie's got his shield strapped to his back. Is like the most uh, efficient way we've seen. 
I'm definitely thinking we're seeing some uh, the full armor of God integration here. Uh, you know, uh, kind of like the full card always makes me think of the placenta. Here he's got it all strapped to his back. He's one with his shield. And no he, one can attack him from behind, really. Right. TN. Totally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Whereas TN. up to this point, we saw a lot of characters with their back exposed to us, like vulnerable. That is interesting. Yeah, when you reach 10, you're reaching definitely like a completion type of feeling, beginning of a new cycle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I found uh, the meaning. So it is uh, Rota, Torah, Orot, Torah, Ator. Supposedly, this means uh, the Wheel of Tarot speaks the law of Hathor, for those interested. Um, and then also, the figures around the wheel, I've always been curious about. And I think they mean several different things, several sort of like Trinity symbols, I guess you can say, uh, trying symbolism. But um, I kind of look at the figure going upward as being like a cardinal sign. And then I think of the figure at the top of the wheel being like a fixed sign. And then the snake going downward being mutable subject to change so something going on the way up something that's stable up top and then something that's transitioning downward nice and then uh this card corresponds with jupiter for anyone who's interested in keeping tabs now mario Yov. <laughs> let me know if there's cards or uh slides on your end you know i'm trying to pay attention to what you have there but if we're missing anything let me know I have for 13. Okay, cool. The next Which is a really is... good one. Okay, we'll try. Let's try to let's try to get there for sure. We have an 11 yeah. 11. We have 11 twice on this one. Tulio. Interesting. I mean, look at that shield. What is going on there? Yeah, it, it's it, almost like, again, the shield is almost like a part of their body, but cutting them off at the waist. This is happening repeatedly. And his legs look extra thick. Uh, more than the rest. And then you've got the hat again. Uh, one of the other things I just wanted to say regarding that Capricorn link with the spiral, with the tail of the sea goat, and then the spiral of the shell and everything, uh, we were looking at spiral horns. So Capricorn and corn and horn being very much related. Uh, the cornucopia, you know, and all that stuff. Purple on both cards. Nice big torch there once Tulio again is, allegedly, the flame. Oh. is this encoding tulis hostilius i will look tulis hostilius being uh the third king of rome in the you know <laughs> possibly not real uh i think that the seven kings of rome before the empire are probably some kind of encoding of the seven months of summer before the five months of winter or suffering and you know justice being libra we're gonna get that point between those two points so also we, tulio know. is allegedly one who leads but uh oh, tulius nice. hostilius you know hot that has the word hostile in it and this is the point of the year where the sun's starting to get more hostile in the sense of starting to kill off more and more vegetation as it gets colder and, uh, you know, this justice card you could look at as a hostile character in a way. He's just holding a sword up. So according to the little booklet, there's no known uh, historical reference for this card, according to his research, at least. But I wonder why this character has like a long mane of hair, a thick beard, you know? Yeah, we haven't seen a lot of beards. Right. And yeah, he's that's got that question. Promethean torch. And this really does not look like a shield in a lot of ways. No, it looks like, like the, the lid base of a garbage of something, can. right? Like, is that the stand where you plant the torch or something? <laughs> or the lid of a God. garbage can? <laughs> it looks like the base of like a candlestick or something. He's got some fat ass legs again. Maybe he's part timing as a concubine. <laughs> <laughs> that's his parasol. <laughs> I mean, honestly, look at his left leg. That's kind of effeminate. Uh huh. That's funny. Deliberately so. And then even the justice figure here. I mean, traditionally it's Lady Justice, right? Uh, but it, it looks a bit ambiguous. 
and they too are just showing there's there's a little emphasis of uh one of their feet the right foot there on the justice card for what it's worth what was the name of the guy in uh mash the cross dresser from mash oh i forget his name but this card the more i look at it the more it reminds me of him yeah that that foot definitely means something oh, there's no doubt about it so I wonder if going forward we'll see like this shell horn thing more up high rather than down low. Is that also representing being on the other side of the year as we've crossed over to the second half of the Arcana and we're crossing the Libra point? I don't know. Good question. Um, let me read the little interpretation here that he has because it does. Um, he incorporates solar symbolism and the transition of the year and everything else um, with this card and many of the others. The upward pointing torch, when contextualized with uh, Postumio's downward pointing torch, constitutes a reference to the Mithraic torchbearers. Uh, I'm going to butcher this. Cates and Catopatis, who mark the solstices and hence the platonic gates of the sun. The southern solstice or gate is marked by an upward pointing torch. Since this celebrates physical death and the liberation of the soul to resume the pure life of the spirit. I want to see what's next. <laughs> okay. Let's do it. Carbone. Wow. This is my favorite card so far. Yeah, look at that. SPQR. Roman and everything. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, why is it your favorite? Let it rip, dude. Just it just has those vibes. It's got it's got that like Roman. It just I don't know. It connects with me. It's got the crescent moon. Look at that giant torch he's got going there. Yeah, powerful. It looks like he's got a bow. Oh no, that's that threshing instrument. What the hell is that thing with that threshing instrument? What is that? You guys know? Yeah, I'm not sure. It could yeah. be uh, that could be um um. Uh, throwing implement it's a uh, two balls on a string uh, you use it uh, very much like a slingshot but it's a, the strings are attached so the spqr is an abbreviation for sinitus populusque romanus Populusque. you'll see that all over uh, italy some it'll change with like depending on what like region it is it'll be like spq and then so you'll see that it's uh it's on roman that. coins and stuff from but it's on like different it's not exclusive to rome it's just like a province thing right but it is maybe coming from the ancient roman republic oh yeah for this it's definitely rome but i'm just saying like that's like a common thing in like the italian like in different towns it'll be like spq and then the letter the last letter might change depending on the title of the city the first letter okay so the sinitus populusque is like you know referring to the fact that it's a republic wherever you're at yeah yeah so uh let me riff on that real quick so the word for a the um a den of vipers, a, a large uh, nest of vipers, genetically is uh, a quiver. A bunch of vipers together are called a quiver. What? And so this is a quiver for his bow and his arrows, right? Well, this is a trip because also the word lachesis, which is one of the three fates, lachesis, her name means a den full of vipers. And so I think with this quiver, we might see be seeing that he is a legislator. So I looked it up and I got cobras, not vipers. Okay. Specifically. I mean, uh -huh. you're on the money, though. I had no idea that a collective name for a group of snakes is a quiver. It's a quiver. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but, you know, we have to throw out there that toxo means bow. Yes. Yes. Carbon so means coal. Means, cobras. So then you have the allusion to black. Okay, yeah. Even so uh, maybe it's like night or something. It's a nighttime card. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think out. it is. Carbo is cobra. Carbo oh, is a oh, anagram for cobra. Nice, nice. Man, so many symbols built well, finish, into Finish this. your thought though before I cut in there, dude. No, that was it. I just that uh the den of vipers, the uh, cobra nest, 
uh, all having to do with the quiver here and the potential for him being uh, some sort of legislator or a, a writer of the laws. So, and the word carbon would refer to like carbon, like burning coal, some uh -huh. burning something, blackening something. So we're back to that symbolism again, too. Nice. Uh, just want to point out the symbolic overlap between the bow and then the crescent moon. Artemis comes to mind. Uh, so lunar symbolism, literally sometimes the, the moon looks like a bow. And so there's a lot of overlapping themes with that. Also, um, just being in Sagittarius too. I'm thinking about that. Uh, but one of the things I want to get your guys' take on is the whole, does it not look like his beard is within uh, that torch that he's holding? It's like a big torch, but little flame, but his beard is in there. And so I think there's something going on with that. Yeah, dude. I have great catch on the bow and the crescent moon, though, because the word archi or arche, referring to an arch, a bow, as in like a bow and arrow, and a bow, anything that has a bow shape, a rainbow, the uh, Sumeritan, Sumerian ocean god, Maratu, also meant rainbow. That was an alternate meaning of the word. Nice. I love it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think even things like that might give you a, a clue to why you get stories of like after uh, the world is flooded because that river, that god, river, ocean, that the Greeks had, there's like an entire Lumashi uh, story going on in terms of how where it lives in the near the Pegasus Square or the the field constellation there um, that tells you about that tells you why the story of the god Ocean is depicted as a river that encircles the Earth. Um, it's all like wordplay and punning, yeah, and otherwise it makes no sense. Why is the god ocean a river <laughs> mm. right and anyway like that great flood uh, having a rainbow at the end of it if there's a, a river or an ocean encircling the world that's like a great flood and then there's also a rainbow involved and there's a lot of other places where you can get a bow out of uh the constellations in context like with the argo navis so anyway that's just interesting that you have a, a bow shaped moon like it's literally tilted you know you wouldn't see the moon in the sky at that angle it wouldn't be an arch shape like that so they're definitely encoding that idea of the bowing uh thing and you know <laughs> i think that's also giving us, us another connection to the uh cobra i don't know yeah no dude that, exactly that's awesome um, I was just going to add to that, that, uh, esoterically the rainbow corresponds many times with Sagittarius and in like the Thoth deck, as an example, there's two cards that correspond with Sagittarius. There, there's several, but one of them being the art card, there's a bow, a rainbow coming out of the cauldron and then literally coming out of the cauldron as well is an arrow. Um, and then also I believe it's a uh, swiftness that there's a, uh, Sagittarius correspondence with that. And then also there's a rainbow literally within the artwork. Um, and then also sometimes uh, in the night sky, when you're looking at sky maps, there's a Sagittarius, uh, there's a version of Sagittarius that's shooting his bow across the arc of the Milky Way. And then he would hit uh, the Gemini twins, essentially, which, which I think is interesting. So there's, yeah, arc bow symbolism with the Milky Way for sure. Um, anyway. Just JB, B, atomic weight of carbon is 12. There you go. Ooh, that's badass. That's, that's a really oh, great That's a great one. Oh, solid weave, Jen. <laughs> Can you zoom in on his beard to get back to what Mario's original thought was? Is that just coincidence or is it actually dipping into it? Can you tell? To I me, it think... looks like it, at the very least, it's a subliminal sort of thing. And what well, would that be? Would that be like some sort of oil or would that be pitch like tar that's light in that? That's a great question. I'm not sure. Because because that's one of the Phoenician names like Italia for Italy and like Calabria. It was known for its pitch. Oh, that's a great point. You're totally on point. Yes. Which is black and it's going to be related to carbon. Yes. Exactly. So, uh, I also, I just took this note the other day and I, I can't find it already, but uh, 
I believe there was some difference where uh, I want to say it was in Egypt where it was like uh, the lowlands would actually burn their uh, their uh, their their poop their uh, their uh, what we would consider uh, compost. They would burn their compost for fuel, and so that would, that would be like they were the carbones, you know, the ones who would use it for fuel. Whereas uh, in the northern other regions, more uh, I think in more Greek regions, they used it for compost. So it would go back into the fields to feed the uh, the next year's crops. So I wonder if that's something that marks him also is uh, a carbone. Interesting. Yeah, dude, <laughs> that's a good weave too. Uh, the I think I left out that the maybe connection to why you have the that acronym referring to the Roman Senate on the quiver mm -hmm. you know maybe they're saying maybe they're saying that the uh, Roman Senate is a quiver of cobras <laughs> right but also just the connection between the word for bow and arc archon arche archon ruler bow arch yeah. you know all all those things well, go together it so to top or head which is wisdom and he's got the white hair which is usually that of somebody who's wise uh where yeah. sage sagax sakart all of that and then when you compare it to hangman which is odin and you see the sun symbolism you're going to be tying into language wisdom the alphabet all of that stuff thought thoot thoth all that and this is a good card. Yeah, I like this one. And it does kind of look like serpent on uh, the bottom of the spear or staff. That's what I was thinking too. We're missing the boat on these ribbons. There's something to these ribbons and there's something to these threshing instruments or whatever they are that, that I think would open up a lot of this. Like, I think there's a story here. It just feels like there's a story that we're missing. Yeah, I get how Peter... Music could have done three years of study on this before getting a book out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. For sure. I really want to read that book now. I'll just add it to the pile. And the color schemes. <laughs> it's had these color schemes, these like three colors or four colors here, you know, like with, not, with the garbs that they're wearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of red, a lot of purple. All right. I want to get to card 13. And this you could almost, you could almost put a, make a mud flood comment with the uh you know the plain background the terrain seems pretty mud muddy is this what you mean by ribbons also dylan like this thing coming off of his back where there's like three balls no I've remember seen a lot the, of that like ropes with three knots or whatever yeah, this is and it looks like it's used to like beat somebody because it's attached to the staff but then there's the ribbon on the staff that one right in this one that particularly looks kind of like serpentine or whatever, but there's on like that kind of like that staff with the crew, uh, the globe, uh, yeah, the globus, whatever on it. And it's got like these ribbon, there's, there's something we're missing that it's probably like, if we were from that era, it would be obvious because it's like traditional, like it's obvious symbolism, but because we don't have, you know, we don't know what it's called or we don't know what those customs are. We're missing it. Yeah. Oh, oh, dude, I just, I think I just got it. Okay. So uh, I was like, you know, probably what we're missing is that we know some of the Latin and Greek names for some of these items, but we don't know all of them because we're not speakers, but <laughs> okay. So one of the words in Latin for ribbon is Lim limniscus, like which is very similar to limniscat or limniscate, which would be the analemma shape. So, is that the fact that there's like a ribbon also talking about the analemma, analemma in some way, the limniscate? I don't know, that's a possibility. I dig that, I dig that because you can use the analemma as a calendar, and you could even take a uh piece of jewelry and fold it up into the shape of the analema and put your jewelry on the gates of the solstice and the equinox and then unfold it and wear it and it would still encode the dimensions of the uh, sacred holidays i dig that a lot uh, another word for ribbon in latin is tania 
which has got like a lot like 10, but an alternate meaning of that word, it could mean ribbon or it could mean tapeworm. <laughs> so that's weird. Oh, that and that does cool. look like measuring tape. Yeah. 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 It's like they, they know the metrics. Those They're lines mean a something. Tapeworm, a tapeworm those lines. is also like a snake of, of a sort, you know? Yeah. They've mastered the metrics of the matrix. Are they, is that encoding? I mean, this is just like a real shot in the dark, but is that encoding a cult that has awareness of like how to cultivate parasites in, in people as a way of dominating their minds or what? Well, Good maybe. question. Tape yeah. such an interesting arrangement. It almost looks like, like, is that like a two letters next to each other or something like that? Like it almost oh, looks like U S or I don't know. You bring I think up a great we really point. You really do need to know all like to really get into this. You need to know like all of the original language terms for all the objects, not just what we would call them. And you need to know the homonyms or, or whatever for those words. Like the fact that right. women, could be limnascate or it could be a tapeworm and Thanks. it relates to 10. Like this is the, this is what I mean by like the uh, priestly punning that I think yes. that's, that's definitely going on in here. And that's part of what we're missing is uh, the multivalent nature of language, hyperdimensional nature of language. Like the, the initiated like would a, have all that. The ribbon almost looks like four or five, you know, which would be the nine symbolism as Mario was talking about with the 4.5 and all that stuff. I don't know. Something, something, there's something there. I just don't oh, know what it is. No, dude, you're, you're on point, man. Uh, definitely. Absolutely. There are letters encoded in some of these cards. Um, and so I know uh, there's at least one or two cards that I've read about that have like Hebrew letters kind of encoded in some of the, literally the whole entire frame of the artwork. And once it's pointed out, you can actually see it. So I would imagine that there are certain things like this that they're putting in there that we just aren't seeing yet, for sure. Because if you so. put a mirror up to that, you might be able, it might look like a two. That five at the bottom, that like right above the 12, it kind of looks like a five. But if you held the mirror up to that, it would look like a two. And then the other one kind of looks like almost like an H. I don't know. There's something no, there. I don't know. Someone's that's a great point, too. I'm sure there is some mirror magic going on within this deck. Yeah. The fact, that he, the fact that his beard is like soaking up the tar or whatever that is, it almost uh, implies that he's uh, he's addicted to it. He does it so much that it uh, it's altered his appearance, you know, like smokers when they get tar stains on their fingers or whatever. You know, this card actually reminds me of the card that I think is more closely associated with the Hermit card where he's holding his beard because by extension, him holding the lantern with his beard within the lantern, it's almost like there's a subliminal holding of the beard going on here as well. Interesting. And then so back to the, the uh, back to the pun craft of all of this, the word for like the first and most common word for ribbon in Latin is vita or vita v-i-t-t-a and since we know that latin has an affinity to the hindu languages and sanskrit i just went and checked out like what does that mean because that sounds like a word from india and it it refers to finance like <laughs> the management of money so is ribbon also encoding like you know it's a tape it's measuring you would measure out the goods or whatever before you sold them or, mm -hmm. you know, is that encoding that in the Senate, you know, they might be managing the weights and measures of money. It's weights also and measures life. and finance go together hand in hand. So like, this is what I mean. Multi multiple levels, multiple languages encoded in one thing here. Well, what, what Gabe was saying about, he's like addicted to it, almost like he's living off that tar or that oil or whatever it is. Vita is also life. Nice. Nice. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like with one as T. You're, as you're saying this stuff, Chance, I'm thinking of uh, Mercury being like a merchant deity, uh, but I also very strongly associate him with the pole. Obviously, the whole psychopomp thing, um, being the guide of souls, going to the other side via the bridge, the pillar, the post, the world tree, and then here on uh, the right hand side, you have the hanged man, literally hanging from the world tree you know, the bridge between realms sort of thing. So whenever I see serpentine symbolism around a pole, I always think of that. I think of, 
you know, um, the Kundalini serpents going up the spine or uh, the uh, world serpent wrapped around the world tree, you know, things like that. That's the first thing. You also thing have to remember that the serpent is a symbol of the cosmos because its scales are shiny like the stars and they all move in unison at the same pace, just like the stars when it moves. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. The The serpent to me is the, oh, pretty much the symbol of symbols, you know. There's so much encoded there. It's insane. Actually such a good symbol. And it's so sad to see like what, like the modern, like Abrahamics have done with it. Yeah, exactly. And it's like now, like everybody can't look at that symbolism because they just like, eh, it's up the devil. It's evil. Satan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So first of all, um, holding a torch, right. And with a bow and arrow, we could also be looking at Apollo. This could be a, a solar encode of that. And then the last thing I want to say about this card, I think, referring to the Neros, is I found out something fascinating about the uh, the Celestials, <laughs> the ancient Chinese, that they had a practice where when a new dynasty would come in to power, they would redo all of the standards of weights and measures and even music. Like there would be a key that all music had to be performed as its tonal center back to that drone, back to that bag bagpipes and uh, a lot of in Indian instruments that have like a droning and uh, tonal center, but that, yeah, then the new dynasty would be thought to be in what, whatever, whoever came into power would thought would be thought to be like representative of a new cosmic order. Like the very, it's very similar to the idea of the Nero's and that, like a renovation of the world would need to take place. You need all the standards would be redone. And so like in terms of standards of measurement, they would be based on whatever the new tonal center was, like whatever the length of the flute was to make that tone or that note would become also the new, like the new measurement of a foot, for example. So, you know, can the, the Senate and the, the measuring tape and, and finance and, all those different aspects could be uh, a Nero's thing talking about like uh, when the next cycle comes in, all of this stuff gets renovated. I don't know. No, but that's, that's, a, that's something that needs to be explored more. That whole idea of dynasties being replaced and it, it means that there's like a new cosmic order and you have to redo everything. I find that fascinating. I was just reading about something along these lines about the, uh, a rod being a standard um tool of measurement and what that represents you know and so you're just bringing all of these different ideas together with that so the tape thing would not have come across my mind but that is very curious i mean it's got it seems like a measuring tape because you can see marks on it yeah yeah right? exactly yeah. i feel like that is a crucial symbol whatever it means you guys this is the dream team for this particular project i'm really happy about this <laughs> Oh, oh this one's fucking hardcore. Oh, <laughs> this it's is another left oh, eye being there. covered, right? Left eye again. Yep, yep, yeah, Damn, exactly. Though. So, um, yeah, there's a lot to say about this one. Um, this is the card that Peter Mark Adams associates with Algol, and that he thinks that Algol, uh, the eye of Medusa, which has its own cycle, so it blinks, right? Really interesting. He thinks that that's what's going on um, in the sky. And then obviously with the spear piercing uh, this eye down below, you can kind of make that eye correspondence with the two. So I think that's very curious. Um, but, you know, I actually think that this is a precursor to the death card. I think this is one of the ones where you can make a direct correspondence, in my opinion. And I think actually um, this spear along with the shield and the helmet is making a subliminal scythe. And so if you go to uh, my slides, I'll show you that. And well, so uh, with the Rider weight version of the death card, you know, he's not holding a scythe, but most traditional versions of the death card, he generally is. Sometimes he's holding a bow and arrow. Uh, there you go. Yeah, exactly. I so totally all I did which is I blacked out the spear going through the head and then just the curve of the shield and the helmet. And you can see the scythe and then you can see uh, other death cards that follow suit. Right. 
Um, also very curious. Nicely like, done, tradition. Mario. Thanks, man. Yeah, this is the first card that I feel like I found stuff that I have not read before, but is definitely there. Um, you'll notice that a lot of other death cards have these heads on the ground, these severed heads. So that is also kind of a, a direct correspondence, in my opinion. Uh, the death card corresponds with Scorpio, the scorpion, which I was trying to figure out. I'm like, why is this head so large? Right. It, it's larger than uh, the main figure's head. Right. And so what I think it's encoding potentially is the uh, the mythology of, um, you know, Orion, the great hunter, um, being uh, stung by a scorpion. And so to me, as far as the night sky is concerned, when uh, Orion is falling, the scorpion is rising. And so I think that that's kind of what's being encoded here, maybe. Is that really? when a uh, scorpion is coming up in the night sky, Taurus is falling, right? That's the relationship. They're opposite each other. And then also Orion's falling as well because it's not too far away. So it's the slaying of Orion, the great hunter. It's kind of how I see it. I dig that. You know, one th other point to, uh, to make is that his scythe is cutting his own standing. It's cutting back on his own feet. Uh, and that's just an... Uh, uh, in both of them, I guess in those other ones too, the, you know, death's own foot is in the swing path of the scythe in those other ones as well. Uh, so I often I think about that um, is something we don't, uh, uh, we don't think about very much anymore because we don't wear, you know, bladed arms on our hips, you know, you don't, uh, you don't hear from your elders, you know, be careful how you handle that. Uh, that scythe there, son, you know, I had the, my first time chopping down uh, uh, weeds with two scythes. I only almost cut my l own leg off about five different times. Guys, this is the second time we've seen that orfatis and it means orphan. And uh, it looks like that's the woman. Remember that woman with the red and purple and the shield? One, her leg was covered one of the times. She's got that same thing. And it looked the... The, it looks like there's a laurel in her hair, but her hair's like yeah. going up. I think that's a woman. I don't think that's a man. Or if it is, maybe it's a feminine man. I don't know. But this is the second time we've, or a third time we've seen her now, or it, or whatever the hell it is. And I think Catone, I, I don't know, the Catone doesn't really seem like, I found like one, like, not really something I would put my reputation on it, but it says a person excessively concerned about proprietary or and decorum or a person who is not pleasant or agreeable, but that's, that's, that, that's not coming from anything like credible. Um, but I can't but, help but notice it also looks like uh, cabron, which is bully. Oh yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, according to Peter Mark Adams real quick. So the historical reference is uh, Cato, the elder, a jurist who fought in the first Punic war. Um, and then he thinks that the ribbon says um, Trahor Fatis. I am driven by fate is what he thinks. But where's the rest of the word? We have yeah, so we the rest see of the it again where we see the rest of it's the on word. the other side. I mean, there's it, oh, there's an implied it, other portion to the ribbon, right? Or the banner. Another. Ribbon. Right. But is there any other cards that show like the other the the beginning of that word? I don't know. I don't know. So it's kind of his conjecture. I mean, that's I mean, I yeah, think yeah. fate is a not a bad not a bad uh possibility obviously cuz death is the fate of all men, but I also found the Latin word fatisco which is to crack open, part asunder, to gape or or crack, but also can mean to grow weak or exhausted. So, I mean, in terms of the uh, sky clock, you know, the scorpion sting is the sun is starting to grow quite weak and exhausted. And yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll just leave it there. If someone else jump on. There's some uh, death cards where death is actually holding a bow and arrow or a spear, which I think is interesting. And I've said this before, but um, there are some sky maps where it shows the arrow of Sagittarius basically being tip to tip with the scorpion stinger. So I think in a lot of ways um, they're kind of symbolically related. So obviously I, I marked over it with uh, 
with black um this scythe outline or whatever but it's a gigantic spear which i think is curious so um yeah that's uh that's where Ophiuchus is dancing on the tip of the the spear of sag and the tail of scorpio that's right yeah exactly right and then my personal belief system is if we're going to talk about death, I think you uh, go to the north upon death. I think we come from and return to the north. So it just makes me wonder if this is a North Star reference. You know, the head on a platter symbolism is interesting because, you know, that's like John the Baptist and the uh, platter is also like a shield. And pretty close to Scorpius, like between Scorpius and Sagittarius, you have the Scutum constellation, which is a shield in the sky. Yeah. Something I want to bring to your attention. I forget what the hieroglyphs called, but um, they said it symbolizes like the dew falling from mana or whatever. But I'm going to show it to you on my phone because I have it in July's end. See that? That's kind of what that star reminds me of. Oh, sorry. Uh, I made you big, yeah. Oh, yeah. Obviously, there's only three, uh, six points on that one, but I don't know. There's the way that that uh, which call it that star is depicted on that uh, on that card. Yeah, the, yeah, it's like a black star, black sun. Yeah, and like if you took away that, like the her, the whatever that plane would be in the middle, it would be the exact same symbol almost. Sure. And, you know, um, there's a whole tradition of showing stars with what they call beards or, or hair or tails, basically, which are more like comets, you know, uh, meteors. Oh, and yeah. yeah. So it makes me wonder if there's like implied movement with this tail, you know, coming down because there's no, uh, you know, it's not coming out from the top. It's just from the bottom. Can you zoom in on that like red orb in like the space behind her or the back? Yeah, that could be also like some kind of stain or damage. Okay. And what's yeah, with her so. eye? Is her eye like the eye of like Ra or something like that? What's going on? There here? is a pretty strong crease there in terms of like of a wrinkle. Mm -hmm. And it's probably totally. significant. Another wrinkle to the mystery. So eye symbolism for sure. It's heavy in this card. Yeah, it's kind of and, trippy that he says that that's the Al goal, because um, to uh, to to be a big nerd, uh, the that actual star is somewhere over in Aries, over with Perseus, and uh, so I just find it a little a little interesting that he's got he's talking about Al, Al goal over here in Scorpio. It's it's not a perfect lineup. I, you know, I agree with you. And there's several stars that are the eyes of constellations. Yeah. So I wonder if he just discovered Algol and it's super malefic and dark, you know, right. seemingly. And then the uh, the symbolism of Medusa. And if you look at her and all that, you know. So oh, I wonder right. if he just got excited and, and made that correspondence. I don't know. You know, um, now that I'm thinking about it, uh, Centaur is spearing, I think, Lynx. Uh, let me go look it up. Uh, at the end of the spear, there is a, I think Centaur is spearing a, an animal at the end of the spear. Let me go see if I can figure that out. Okay. So to the Cato aspect of this, if we're talking about the Roman Senate, the famous Cato, the elder, was uh, in opposition. I'm just reading this off of a, a Google search. Of course, you know, this is history air quotes but cato the elder was a roman statesman and orator noted for his conservative and anti-hellenic policies in opposition to the pro-hellenic ideals of the scipio family i just find that interesting scipio scorpio death card and uh, you know obviously the scipios won out because rome got pretty hellenized I mean, that's uh, maybe not <laughs> whatever is going on with that story, maybe more astro theology, occult yeah. encoding, but there's I'm going to post something in the uh, the link 
if you look at like the images of Cato, the elder, he's got that weird creased eye. So that's probably what it is. Oh. If so, you just yeah. look at the statue. So he's the an ugly son of a bitch. <laughs> so the, the animal on the it. The animal on... did it put that next to John McCain and <laughs> said they look like each other. <laughs> nice. So the animal on the end of Centaurus's spear is uh, lupus, is the wolf. So that would have a stronger relationship to that, the eye with the spear in its head. Damn. Got it. That is really an ugly mofo. What up, Cheney? Yeah, what's up, Cheney? That's a good weave right there. Ophiuchus is definitely in the mix in this part of the sky clock. Yes. yes and I like is. that you gave the uh, Temis, Tems <laughs> name for Libra. It's Dylan interesting. goes into that in his fourth book. If we're talking about Ophiuchus, we're talking about the serpent bearer. Could this ribbon be a symbolic serpent that he's holding? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, now that we've got all these different meanings for ribbon in Latin, <laughs> very all kinds of possibilities are on the table. And, you know, like back to the, the punning of everything, what are some of the alternate meanings and homonyms in the Latin for the word for spear? You know, that could tell us something. I'm going to do a little searching. Yeah, please do. The jail. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that the spear goes over uh potentially his crotch area if it is a he and so i think that is uh, very much deliberate and if you look at the crowley version of the death card uh death is at the bottom of the ocean and he has his scythe but there's this line that basically emanates from his crotch and these are like where the souls are being like germinated or captured in these bubbles and they're going to the other side um and so there is this sort of correspondence there with the crotch somehow being related to death. So the Latin word for spear, there's a ton of them. You have uh, hosta, asta, tellum. Uh, some of them are also words that mean arrow or any kind of missile. You have, so hostile, you know, back to the tulus hostilius. You have spicus or spicum, spiculum. You have uh, one that I found interesting, curis, cures, kind of like curates. So there's like tons of words for spear in Latin. And if we were getting into, like if we knew these languages the way that uh, someone who was a speaker or a scholar did, there would have to be like all kinds of homonyms that might give us more clues into the symbolism for that. Like, so one of, here's a weird one. One of the words... Uh, curies, curies for spear, Q U I R I S, means spear and it means Roman citizen. Weird. Interesting. It reminds yeah. me of uh, the fact that we're P pole, you know, like pole is literally like as in, you know, the, the pole right here that we're looking yeah. at. Pylum. Pylum yeah. is another word for spear. Pole, Interesting. Pylum. And I'm just looking at the Rider weight version of the card, just real quick. Uh, you know, the pole with the flag, you know, it almost seems like there's a deliberate, intentional sort of matching up with the pole and then um, the left leg of that horse, almost like there's supposed to be a continuous sort of line there, you know, even if it's a subliminal sort of thing. And then I can't help but notice that this spear, once again, is literally going from the very tippy top of the card all the way to the bottom, you know, very deliberate. Right. Uh, kind of, do you guys know what kind of flower that is? I thought for some reason I thought it was like a pomegranate, but I don't know what it is. I think it's a I poppy. Poppy's poppy's a good guess. I like poppy. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think be wrong I, with that. I often think about the white horse being symbolic of you know all of the uh, the industrialized white powdered substances that are constitute a cartel you know flour sugar it's a white rose my cocaine. bad it's the, the tudor yeah. rose the tudor rose yeah my okay bad. 
but I could see why people don't necessarily associate this with Rose, but this is how the Rose is commonly depicted with the five petals or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I like the poppy idea too, a lot. Uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, similarities between the, like a a pomegranate. If you look at it from the top down, you know, kind of has the uh, weird crown that you would be looking inside of. Uh, which is also a for another forbidden fruit that we know of. So guys, I want to take us on to card 14 um, and then maybe wrap up for now, but I would like, I wanted to get to at least 14 because I mean, Whoa. damn, check this out. What the hell? Oh, cool. <laughs> and then if you guys are down, I'd love to revisit this and maybe look at the rest of the majors and uh, some of the court cards would be pretty fun. Yeah. Whoa. This has been awesome. So we're looking at Bacchus. This is one of the, another one of the reasons why I'm thinking we could be encoding Nero's in some way. Right. It says here, King Bacchus of Numidia, who betrayed his son-in-law, Jugurtha, to the Romans. And uh, at some point, I did a deep dive on this card. And if I'm not mistaken, there is a demonic possession going on. And so he's actually um, being taken for a ride here you know, by some other entity or spirit. And that he... Which is very, Bach, you know, madness, Bacchanalia, that whole yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like he's lusting for debauchery or war or something along those lines, if I'm not mistaken. Looks what? like, he, I mean, I, honestly, he's got the knee pads. Is that so he can give BJs? I mean, this, there's a lot of homoerotic stuff in here. Let's yeah, roll a lot of red rockets <laughs> man what a trip uh and so it's also the standard temperance card is on the bank of the river you know is uh standing part in the water part on land and so that's kind of implicit in that Baco name and in this deck this so far i don't think i've even seen a drop of water but there's been like occulted water symbolism with the shells and stuff. That's a good point. That's trippy. That's trippy. Man. Yeah, the, uh, the, the traditional thing. correspondence with temperance is Sagittarius, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. What but a trippy car. It also has an Aquarian vibe in terms of the the water involved yeah Th- this is a very deranged face though it's, it's, it. it's almost like the opposite of the one from before from the the hierophant or the uh, hermit the one with the hermit where he's looking up happily reflecting positive vibes to the sky it's like this guy is a uh, strange perfect inversion of that so i also found out thank you google that baco is a combination of beans and nachos when you're eating beans and nachos mixed together it's bacos bachos <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what he's hungry for that's not not up, dude. the elusive <laughs> mysteries have been solved <laughs> <laughs> all right we can move on from this card <laughs> The two fingers that are hidden behind the shield would make the uh, that uh, hand gesture of benediction. We also have the 14 is on the card twice, so that's also giving us a 28, like a lunar. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what Baco was in numerology to see if it like corresponded to like a 333 type of deal, like or whatever. Yeah, this one is a mystery we might even you know come might even start here if we do another one of these and uh see how we see what we think after time to independently reflect on this one yeah we're we're missing something with that shield because it's the third time it's propped up like that it's got an m and maybe a u in it yeah an m and we're also missing something with that red flag that's appeared a few times so baco oh yeah we're missing gives a lot. Us 29 <laughs> in ordinal, which is kind of, you know, it's rule of Kal-El. It's one off. 
So it counts <laughs> between 28 and 29. If you're counting the 14 twice as it's depicted on there twice. Um, but it's probably not, you know, it's probably the Latin cipher that we ought to be looking at in terms of this, which means if we did it in the Latin cipher, Baco would give you 64. And that's a pretty significant number. Well, is that Baco or Boco? It looks like there's an A that's scribbled over an O. Yeah, right. I'm I wonder about that too. Maybe it's supposed to be Boco. What Mario, what does it say in your reference material? Uh Baco. B A. With with an A? Yeah. Okay. Wonder what wonder I, that is a weird thing because it does look like it was an O. Like that, the O part looks faded, like it's the original, and like someone wrote the A over in a different script, right? It doesn't look like the same writing. My bad. Uh, it's O. I just double checked. Okay, so my bad on the slide. <laughs> Bacchus on the mind. What is? <laughs> what is it with an O? Then you know, no longer beans and nachos. Something else. <laughs> You know, one thing uh, that we know about the temperance, and we've said this before, is sometimes it almost would appear as though the water is pouring unnaturally from one cup to the other. You know, it almost because of the arrow on the chest of the uh, of the temperance angel, which looks like the sulfur sign for sulfur is the, the arrow pointing up, but it almost indicates that the water is flowing in a unnatural relationship to the other cup which is correspondent with mario's assertion that this this far card number 14 has something unnatural an unnatural flow to the life energy of the character here yeah if i'm not mistaken i'm trying to remember what i read about it i can't find it in the book real quick it also allegedly means clever in spanish both or both. or brain uh. like the actual brain itself I think the implication is somehow he's making love to the shield, but the shield um, has uh, powers associated with it. The demonic dark powers is, is what I recall reading, but this was years ago. Too. Wow. So he's doing a defensive spell. Getting off on his shield. Something along those lines. Yeah. Well, Cause I, I remember when I read that, I, this, like, I think they're shit. offensive. I'm very offended. <laughs> Yeah, well, I wonder what that kind of a shield is called, too. The shape of it. <laughs> right. You know, the other thing I'll say, um, traditionally, a lot of temperance cards, I've noticed that the water splits the figure in half from upper to lower, you know. So it just kind of gets me thinking about, you know, um, some of those qualities with this card oh, and his lower yeah. nature, you know. But yeah, he's yeah. looking upward. So to go into, you know, the wordplay possibilities, the we know scutum is a shield, right? But there's probably different names for <laughs> wow. Yeah, I'm just looking at all the list of names for words for shield and like half of them could mean shield or they could mean the disk of the sun, solar disk in the same word. So there's that, but um some interesting shield words are tutor like tutor tutoring so tutor like as in a teacher was apparently like a protector or a shield uh, in latin so that's interesting and then you have um uh what was the other one parma parma which kind of encodes palma parma palma so are we mm -hmm. looking at you know um some punning on the palm tree because in one of the disc shaped shields, there was a palm tree on it. So are we getting a reminder of the palm tree and the encoding of the year of our Lord? Well, mm. also Prama is uh, Gabe. Remember when we were looking at Monte Prama and you're like, what does that mean? First Mount, whatever uh -huh. Prama in uh, I think it's Sanskrit or one of those, it's either Sanskrit or Hindi. It just means the correct notion true knowledge basis foundation understand so it's like the mountain of wisdom or of understanding or of gnosis okay, okay nice and that's kind of interestingly connected to tutor as a shield word for shield and, and also you said with that son that clearly is the astro 
astrological symbol of the sun on its forehead for temperance. Nice. You know, this is kind of a wild side weave, but I think it, uh, I think this is a good circle to bring it, uh, to bring it on offer. Uh, recently discovered that um, Carl Jung had his hands on the Nagamati texts, which is quite profound to me. Uh, uh, the world gets smaller and smaller the more you learn. Uh, that's a big link for me to know that Carl Jung touched the Nagamati's. And something really fascinating, it turns out that there's a word for gnosis that we know. It means knowledge, right? Gnosis means knowledge. But there's a word that did not get emphasized in the uh, Nagamadis, and that is uh, ecstaticos, or to be in an in a, in a ecstatic state. And there's actually a difference between the gnosis, knowledge, and uh, having an ec ecstatic state. And I think this is the difference between understanding and overstanding. I think that this is the difference between, uh, I think in German they called it uh, Verstehen is understanding, and then there's Vernunft. And Vernunft is like a, a higher level of knowing. And uh, something I'm going to try to suss out is uh, uh, maybe the fact that the Nagamadi, that there might have been like a lower branch of knowledge circulated and that the higher branch is on that ecstaticoi uh and i think there's a lot to suss out there and i'm starting to look at carl jung with more and more critical lens the more i learn i got something to add to this just because i saw that square and triangle yeah, yeah. and uh, it's coming from my uh, next book it'll be in there but it's a quote from michaelius and the reason i saw that is because if you add the sides of the square and the triangle, you get seven. And so the holiness of the Sabbath day or seventh day is attributed to that result. And he wrote, the Jews uh, ascribed almost all diseases to the influence of evil spirits. To cure a disease, therefore, was, according to their notions, to expel an evil spirit. This they pretended to affect by charms and herbs. And we have seen from Eusebius, what extraordinary uh, efficacy and virtue the Therapeutans ascribed to prayer and fasting. And the reason that is important is because that's like the origins of the Christian system and the church system and the mon monastic uh, system. But because Mario was saying this was like evil spirits or demon infestation or possession, possibly, yeah. you know, there might be something there. Nice, dude. I love the seven connection with the uh, square and triangle and actually chance do you mind, since you brought it up, zooming in really, really tight on that uh, square and triangle? That's as far as I can zoom. Right above it, you have yod heh vav -Hey. Oh, yeah, oh. you do. Whoa. Yeah. Nice. Sneaky. Catch. Yeah, yeah. The Rider Waite has <laughs> some great stuff going on with it. It's so <laughs> common and popular, but I love it. I like it, too. I think it's the best one to learn on. Um, so the, what I thought was an M on his shield, I'm now looking at more like an N, but it's hard to know if it is an N that could encode nil, nihilus, nullus, zero, Whoa. zilch, nada, trippy or sun, nun. It's like sun, S O N like progeny. Okay. Yeah. Also, uh, just wanted to point out, I don't think that this is the encode or whatever, but, you know, the A inside of a circle is the classic anarchist symbol. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, Bacchanalia is pretty anarchistic. Baco. No. Zoom in on that A. What the hell is it? Did somebody else, like, augment this? Like, what, what That's what it, it looks like to me. It, it also looks look like, like it could be like a, um, what do they call that symbol that, like, the NASA is okay. used and stuff. Guys, that H doesn't look like an H. It looks like Bacchio or Baccio or something. Like, wh what the hell's going on with this word? Because interesting, there's some. I, there could be some gravel with this. There's definitely some gravel. And look, if you look closer at his hair, you got the curls too, which is a, you know, there's a it's a very Buddhic, uh, woolly, you know, similar to the symbolism of the Am Amanian. He's got that yeah. five spire or spiked crown. 
What if somebody at some point wanted the A instead of the O? Uh, So it's numerologically, gematriologically (laughs) more sound to whatever their system is or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know what the difference would be, but would not be surprised. Dude, I think I got it. Look at his neck. Does his neck look like it's swelling? Yeah. So Bocio is a goiter, a swelling at the front of the neck due to enlargement of the thyroid gland. Holy shit, y'all. Nice. That's really interesting. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, my gosh. Maybe anecdotal, maybe not. No, that is that is really something like... Man, yeah, that oh, there's so much could be uh, implicit to that. Like, uh, would a swollen thyroid come from a certain type of addiction, a a long life of a certain type of addiction, you know? Right. Dude, he does have the phenotype of uh, like an addict or damaged person. Yeah. 100%, yeah. And so the fasting was kind of uh, implicit to that as well. Um, the idea that he had too much of something, he needs to re- refrain from whatever gave him the, his goiter. What a trip. And the fasting also, I think, corresponds to the cup pouring in the r- wrong direction. It's like, the, you know, the way to undo something that you've taken in is to fast. It's the way to reverse the the effects. It's kind of interesting too, just thinking of the contrast between these two cards. You know, temperance has a lot to do with healing, in my opinion. Uh, herbalism and just kind of like self work. Your holy guardian angel helping you get through certain things and what have you. Uh, I also think of uh, the story of Chiron. You know, the wounded healer and how that's very much related to Sagittarius, which this card corresponds with. And then you have all this illness with Bacho over here who <laughs> clearly yeah. needs help. What uh can you zoom in on his foot? Like, is that part of the or is that I don't know what the hell that is. I saw that earlier, but then I was like, well, I yeah, know. I was wondering about that too. So another interesting wordplay pun that could be going on is um so when we say the word flag, he's he's holding a flag, right? When we're saying the word flag, we could also refer to flag as in like uh, loose. <laughs> so in in Latin, the idea of a flag, like the way that it just limply hangs, is uh-huh. also connected towards like flaccio, which is to be flabby or oh, to be like- un- not courageous or flaccid flaccid (laughs) flaccid yes so or uh marchio or marcho or marco i don't know uh it's probably not marco but m-a-r-c-o m-a-r-c-e-o words that have to do with apathy weakness slackness drooping withering and you know Mm -hmm. wither wither is an interesting one of the definitions for that um (laughs) even lang like languor like being languid Linguisco, yeah. linguesto, um, you know, rem, remito, like remit. A lot of these words, flag is one of the definitions. And so there could be <laughs> shit, even like the word for freeze, refrigesco, <laughs> like refrigerate, cooling, yeah. you know, that's also happening at this point in the sky clock. Things are starting to chill, freeze. Um, and flag is a word for that. So like there's just look up Latin words for flag. And most of them are most of the ones I just named are noun or verbs. But, um, you know, that's interesting. There's wordplay there, possibly. Because he's definitely f- looking flabby and ap- uh-huh. languid and apathetic and flaccid, flaccid, <laughs> dro- droopy, <laughs> weak. I like the goiter thing. That's a trip. It's really weird. Yeah. Yeah, guys. Nice. I expect a a goiter meme from Slick. uh, (laughs) All right, guys, I think we can. uh, I think we can wrap this up. I mean, it's exciting. There's 
oh, it's so exciting. I really like want to talk about card 16 because there's a Phoenix in it and um, the tower card and the Phoenix correlation. But if you guys are down, I'll put another one on the calendar and we can revisit this because I'm, I really had a lot of fun tonight and I appreciate you guys. And, you know, we got to wrap it up at three hours, 33 minutes, Illuminati confirmed. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It, but, you know, closing thoughts are, are cool. If anything got left behind and um, plugs as well, we'll start with Dylan and, and go around to Mario. Oh, you're muted there, bro. Mr. Scotia. Having me on. It was fun uh, shooting the shit with you. And I like, uh, I like not having the pressure of to having to be prepared. Like I didn't know anything about this deck. I've seen a couple of them before, but other than that, it was cool. It was fun talking to you guys. Yeah, dude, the on the fly researching live is a lot of fun. Plug your, uh, plug your work, man. I know you got a brand new book. I'm in the middle of. Oh yeah. Just, uh, I posted the link to all my, like everything for like podcasts, books, uh, audio books. And, uh, yeah, you support, uh, my audio books, uh, at least some of them chances, uh, done the third one and he's doing, he's almost done with the fourth one and hopefully he'll be able to ease into the fifth one. Um, if you but, will let me, I'll do it. I want to. Oh, it'll be, it's going to be the easiest one you've done so far. Cause there's not like crazy language. It, it might be a little bit longer than some of them, but there's not, you don't have to spend time looking up how to pronounce shit in this one. So I think <laughs> you'll appreciate that. Oh yeah. Sounds great. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, my, I'm the author of Spirit World, W-H-I-R-L-E-D, The Tale of Onora, O-N-O-R-A, if you guys want some red pill fantasy. Um, I'd like to get back into that. And then uh, I also wrote Get Mad or Get Realistic and How to Transform Your Life Around uh, and, and Get Back to Crushing. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, yeah, so Slick Dissident on YouTube. Uh, also down with the Weaving Spiders webs and over here with Chance and the Interverse. Uh, got a couple of things popping up on a one on one podcast uh, and quite a few things actually. Uh, we're going to do the uh, run through with the Enneagram and the Greek Pantheon, and then we're about to uh, hit up the Star Wars. And uh, I think Chance and I are going to give the Star Wars Enneagram a run here real soon. So, yeah, a lot of fun things on the horizon. Yeah, on Sunday night, guys, me and Gabriel are going to do a mano y mano show on the Enneagram, and Star Wars might creep into it, but I think that we're going to have a unique angle on the one through nine to, relative to the other shows you're doing on it, but um, I'm excited about that. I think it's going to be fascinating getting to the core archetypes in our realm, the uh, abstractions that somehow find their way in, like through the through the mind and through the logos in... We can see the reflection in nature maybe too. So yeah, Sunday night at 8 p.m. We're going to do that one live and direct. Looking forward to that. And Mario, my man, any closing thoughts? And I got to say, thank you for bringing this topic to the table. And I really had a lot of fun. This was a great team. And as always, I appreciate your insights and you're a gentleman and a scholar, dude. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, actually, honestly, Slick brought it back to my attention. Uh, I look at this deck, you know, Fairly often, every single time we go through a new sign, I'm pulling out the cards that correspond with that sign. So I do handle the Solabusca like regularly, but Slick made some memes about it. And I was like, oh shit, he's gotten into the Solabusca. I want to talk to him and see what he thinks, you know? Uh, but as far as closing thoughts are concerned, um, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Scarlet Imprint, who makes a really solid version of the Solabusca. So if you want to actually have like a physical copy around, I don't know if they're out of print or what, but it is like the highest quality version. I think that's even out there. Um, so shout out to those guys. Um, but you can find me at symbolicstudies.com. I would be happy to do a part two. Um, all of your guys' insights are well taken. So this was a great time. Uh, thanks for having me, dude. You're the host with the most. I couldn't do it without you guys. Y'all are the best. And uh, thanks everyone for tuning in, especially to pretty much everybody that I see in the chat who's been here for the whole three and a half hours. That's awesome. Remember my merch store that I mentioned, interversemerch.com. If you're looking for something cool and different for the holidays, I'm going to be adding more to it. And uh, definitely pick up Spirit World. Go watch Symbolic Studies and Slick Dissident on YouTube. And hit me up for a tuning if you want to get one in December. That's also still a thing. 
And uh, we're, we're out of here, guys. We'll see you for a part two, maybe sometime in the next month. And uh, much love. Bye-bye.